Today's meeting of the California Transportation Commission. Today is our June 24th, 2020 meeting. We're pleased to have you join us today. Douglas, could you please read the roll? Thank you, Vice Chair Norton. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Davis. Here. Commissioner Dunn. Present. Commissioner Eager. Here. Commissioner Gordino. Present. Commissioner Inman. Present. Commissioner Kehoe. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Tavaloni. Here. Vice Chair Norton. Present. Senator Bell. Assemblymember Frazier. Madam Vice Chair, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, today, I'm pleased to make sure that we have a presentation, a transportation equity overview. That's going to be starting from at 10 and go till 11. We are going to move items 8 through 11 after that 11 o'clock uh, finalization of the presentation. So our very first item is going to be the um, resolution of necessity, uh, item two. Uh, is Anderson. anyone hearing me, Yvonne Burke? Yes, we are, Commissioner Burke. Oh, okay. I thought they didn't hear me for roll call. I'm <laughs> sorry. It, Douglas, do you want to call roll again for Commissioner Burke? Commissioner Burke, we do have you noted. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, let's start with um, item two. Yes, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, commissioners, this Ron hearing was requested by the property owners, Jonathan and Angela Noldner, due to impacts to their property caused by an $83 million STIP project on US 395 in Inyo County. The purpose of this project is to increase the safety of this section of US 395 and provide four lane route continuity with the adjacent four lane expressway sections. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask, are the property owners or representative online? And if you are, perhaps you could raise your hand so we can make sure that you can have a moment to address the commissioners. And Jonathan, Jonathan you're on? Yes, yes, I'm on. Okay, okay let, me, um, let me read a few more things, Jonathan, and then um, we will, we'll come back to you, okay? Okay. Perfect. Okay, commissioners, the, the Nobler um, property is 38.85 acres zoned open space. The area required for this project is comprised of 11.17 acres of fee and 3.76 acres of access easement for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. The parcel is unimproved, but most of the perimeter is fenced with three strand barbed wire fencing. The property has no utilities, but electric and phone are nearby. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. Number one, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Number two, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Number three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired, nor deals with any issue other than the three just stated. Government code section 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed. The department has made the required offer. Code of Civil Procedures section 1245.240 specifies eight affirmative votes for commission approval of a resolution of necessity. Welcome. Mike Whiteside, the department's assistant chief engineer, is ready to make the department's presentation and then we will be, we'll follow that with the property owner. So Mike Whiteside, I believe you are on the webinar. Good morning, I'm here. Great. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Mike Whiteside, the Caltrans assistant chief engineer. Uh, 
The department requests your approval of uh, this resolution of necessity for the safety project on US 395 uh, in District 9, the property zoned by Jonathan and Angela Noldner. Uh, next slide, please. So the project is in Inyo County. Uh, you see it here outlined in blue near the town of Alancha. It's currently a two lane undivided conventional highway. Uh, the environmental document or the environmental impact report, environmental assessment uh, for this project had a finding of no significant impact in May of 2017. Next slide, please. Okay, so here you see the project limits in blue. The project will reroute and widen 395 to a four lane divided highway. Next. And here you see the subject parcel is outlined or shaded in green. Next. So the project purpose, as Terry mentioned, is to increase safety, but it's also going to reduce congestion and improve route continuity. It's funded by STIP and ITIP funds and a partnership between Inyo, Mono, and uh, counties. Next. We were looking north across the parcel. As Terry mentioned, the area is unimproved. It's uh, zoned open space 40 acres. Uh, that zoning won't change. But the most notable feature of this parcel is uh, in the foreground here. Uh, the parcel touches the Los Angeles Aqueduct owned by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, uh, who I'll just call DWP from here on out. Next. Okay, so here you see an aerial view of the parcel in green. Uh, next. And here you see the proposed improvements in blue. Um, it includes two access roads for LADWP to access their aqueduct for maintenance. Next. The department is seeking, as Terry mentioned, uh, about 11 acres in fee. Next. And about uh, a little under four acres for the utility access easement for LADWP. Uh, I want to note that the access easements will be secured such that only the property owner and uh, DWP will have access. Next. Uh, the project also includes several casings uh, for a future water line at the request of the owner. Next. And I do want to point out there in the red circle, uh, the, the parcel, it does, again, touch the Los Angeles Aqueduct. Uh, this access is maintained. Uh, the owner has indicated he plans to uh, establish groundwater rights and then pump water into the aqueduct to sell it down streams. I also want to note that the owner will retain all the water rights for these acquisitions or under these acquisitions. Next. So uh, over the approximately 22 months that we've been engaging with the grantor, we've had over, well, almost 70 contacts that appear. Uh, and a great number of issues have been discussed and resolved. I won't go into them here, but I will say that at the last meeting, Mr. Noldner uh, did praise the design, and there are only just a few outstanding issues remaining that I'll go into right now. Next. Okay, related to the findings of the commission. The property owner contends uh, that we reduce the easement width, uh, DWP easement width. Next. Uh, the department's response is the easements will be transferred in the property of the DWP. The DWP uh, requires a 20 foot minimum roadway for their large vehicles, but it is wider than 20 foot uh, where the trucks need a turning radius. Uh, so it, it's not strictly just 20 feet. In, in addition, these uh, access easements are not at grade, they are in cut sections below grade or elevated sections above grade, so they're side slopes. <clears throat> and LADWP needs to be have the easements wide enough that they can maintain those side slopes. Uh, so we really can't narrow the easements uh, to anything less than, than we have them currently. Next. Next, the property owner contends that uh, we should just avoid his parcel and move the project to the west. Next, the department's response is that the current alignment minimizes impacts. Uh, we did do an analysis and found that the realignment as proposed to, to avoid the parcel would add five acres of additional property required. It would impact three additional, uh, three additional parcels would be needed. We would increase impacts to develop parcels at the north end of the project 
and we would have uh, higher filled sections. In other words, where the roadway is elevated above grade, those fills would be higher, so there would be a lot more earthwork and there would be greater environment impact. So as planned, the project minimizes impacts overall. Next. And the final contention is that the offer is too low because uh, he maintains the water rights. Uh, the department's response, next, is that that is a compensation issue. Next. So in summary, the public interest and necessity require the project. The project is planned and located in a manner most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned as necessary and an offer has been made. Uh, in conclusion, the department will actively continue to engage with the property owner and continue to negotiate. But in order to ensure that this project continues forward, the safety project continues forward, uh, the department requests approval of this resolution today. And now uh, District 9 Director Ryan Dermody and I are here and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have anyone scheduled for uh, public comment or wishes to speak on this item? I think at this time we have the property owner online, Jonathan. Yes, I am. Yeah, I, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, he, he is right in saying that almost all um, points of contention have been resolved. And I wanted to say that I've been very pleased working with Tanisha Barfield and David Rodriguez, uh, who are employed by the Caltrans. They've been very helpful and accommodating. However, um, there, there's a little issue with the sleeves crossing the right of way um, to accommodate um, the mainline water pipe, um, the high power um, electrical lines, and the instrumentation signal wires. Uh, we're just resolving that out. We're working that out. Um, it was supposed to go to Caltrans Engineering but I have not been able to get in touch with them yet. Um, I'm working through um, the right of way representatives and um, that's, that's just a little hitch. Um, as far as the, the pr property value, I think would affect, uh, it could affect the placement of the, the highway because um, we've gotten, we've, hired an appraiser to come in that's more familiar with water rights and the initial estimates are it's at least fifty thousand dollars an acre so i don't know if that if that changes the um way things look from a monetary standpoint or not uh, and that's that's just for the water rights they're determining the the property value separate of that um and the fact the fact that it's clipped off by the los angeles aqueduct and the california water wheeling law um not only allows but um makes the the um infrastructure accommodate any water that i might move through there 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 they're to accommodate it. They're to work with me to accommodate it. And that's the big um, positive to that that whole property. There are, the property is actually 48.85 acres. There are two parcels that um, adjoin the 38.85 acre parcel to the east. So it's one contiguous property. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the, the highway crossing, and I don't even have a problem with the LADW, um, the easements given to the LADWP. The, the only problem I had is, would I be able to use the easements after they place their road, including, and I don't even know if I can do this, um, putting in a billboard or two, um, making the most of the um, situation and um, also irrigating because I need to um, irrigate as much ground as I can for, for the project. I have, to, I have to establish water usage 
<laughs> irrigation. So, and then when, when they take the, the land away, um, I no longer have 40 acres. So it drops below the OS 40 rating. The OS 40 zoning, excuse me, it's zoning, um, means that the county encourages development agriculturally of the, pro of the property, including drilling a large diameter well. I've had the well drillers out. Um, I've talked to consultants. Um, it's, it's all go. The water is only 40 feet below the ground. There are five wells on adjoining properties. The water is very good quality. In fact, Crystal Geyser is only two within two miles. Crystal Geyser water bottling plant. And I just don't want to be restricted from the aqueduct by the project. If, if I can get across the aqueduct, and it looks like I am, um, and if I can work with you before you give the land to LADWP for the easement for their own M roads um, to where I can use it after they place their road. And, and I don't want to restrict them in any manner. I don't think that would be an issue. I just want to be able to use that easement as much as I can because I'm paying taxes for it and I need the acreage. There's not much acreage available. It's all surrounded by um, government land, except to the east. So, Jonathan, I this is Terry Anderson, CTC. So, I'm I hear three questions that you have that I think um, it would be appropriate for Caltrans to respond to before the commissioners um, take a vote on this. It sounded like number one: Can you continue to use the easements in the after condition? Um, the question about the OS forty rating. And then um, your first one with regards to location of, um, I think you said lines or signal lines, I'm not sure, but. Yeah, yeah um, it's the, the sleeving the sleeving through the right of way to accommodate okay. the water main, the signal wires and the high voltage, high, high power lines. Okay, so if, if Caltrans, so I'm gonna have Caltrans respond to those. I think some of your other concerns are more related to compensation, which is not um, something for the commissioners to discuss today. But Caltrans, can you address those three points, please? Sure, happy to. Uh, yes, we've indicated that uh, within the uh, access easements, uh, Mr. Noldner will still have access <clears throat> and use of that land uh, pending the requirements of DWP's uh, 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 access easement agreement. Uh, the area will be secured but only DWP and the property owner will have uh, access to that uh, to those easements that those easements maintenance easement roads. Regarding the uh, zoning, we have uh, confirmed with Inyo County that this acquisition will not impact uh, the OS40 zoning. So um, because we're going because we're, the way we're acquiring it, it won't change the uh, the zoning. And as far as the casings, we're happy to work with Mr. Noldner. We've had several proposals on the table. Now, the department cannot engineer those casings uh, for him. Uh, we need him to tell us what he needs, and then we will do our best to accommodate it within our own requirements. Um, but we can't engineer the, the actual casings uh, for him. And anything else? I think that pretty well covers it. The only, um, as long as I have the sleeving across, um, that takes care of that issue. And the the easement with the LADWP, if if I can even do it, if I can put a billboard or two on the um, side of the of the highway, probably to the east side, because I, I think there's probably issues with. Um, seen it going to the western side, um, but if I could do that after they place their road in a way that doesn't doesn't conflict with their interests, that I would be all go. I would be willing to sign off on some kind of a deal. Okay, so, Terry, are we ready to put this yes. before the commission? Commissioners, I would recommend that you um, make a, um, um, 
you you consider this uh, resolution of necessity at this time. Do we have a motion? This is Bob Alvarado. I'd like to make a motion to accept staff recommendation. Thank you. A second? Have a only second. Wonderful. Okay. And Douglas, Madam could you Chair, please read the roll? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this is Chris. I have yes, a Commissioner Kehoe. Uh, what's, yeah. Terry, can you uh, walk me through uh, the discussion on the billboard there at the very end of the property owner's comments? So it sounded like he would like to have access to the easements um, in the after condition. Um, and I, it sounded to me what Caltrans point is, he would have to work with LA, the, the water district on that. Um, so, I, and I think he has access to the easements. I'm not sure whether or not um, Caltrans can respond to whether or not um, billboards would be allowed within that easement or if they're aware of that condition. Can Caltrans comment? Is Mike unmuted? Mike Whiteside? Um, you know, we can't speak to that. This is uh, subject to the terms and conditions of the LADWP. We do know that there will be some uh, development or uh, improvements allowed but we have not uh, talked to DWP to s establish whether they could put, you know, billboards in their access easement. I imagine it, it's subject to their being able to access with very large equipment and to maintain uh, the side slopes. But uh, I can't speak to what DWP's requirements are. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay. Terry. This, this, thank this is Tavaloni. Um, no, does, wouldn't the owner have to get all the approvals and permits and whatever needs to be done in order to put those signs up, those billboards up, and get approvals from everybody that they need to have approvals from? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, uh, they would, and that's subject to approval by the County of Inyo as well as the uh, specifics in the DWP easement agreement. Okay, so he's he's agreeable to all of that. It is my understanding, yes. Uh, could, could I comment on that? Please. Uh, the the reason I I became interested in the billboards is I was contacted a number of times by people that wanted to buy the remainder of my property for billboards. They wanted to buy the remaining. 34 acres or whatever just to put billboards on the property and then I thought uh, um, it was an opportunity that I might want to look into I haven't really looked into it beyond that you know I, I can say that uh, he will retain all his access rights as long as, as the owner doesn't unreasonably interfere with DWP's access I, I think that would be okay. I, I just, I would like to make sure that, you know, if, if, you know, that I would be able to put something there as, you know, as long as I don't intersect or restrict their roadway at all. Uh, if well, that, I that would be, as I understand, that would be entirely up to the county or city or whoever that you need to go through in order to acquire a permit to put that on uh, they may not even whether it be caltrans or whether it be the county may not approve your signs billboards on there that's why i'm i'm, I'm uh, suggesting that uh, all the uh, permits uh, need to be approved and and then uh, billboards can go up that that's correct commissioner the, uh, the property owner, Mr. Nolner, will have to get permits from the local jurisdiction, which is the county. Okay. Well, if you if if if, if you'll make sure that all of that is is uh, is taken care of, then I then I, then I believe we'd be all right. Okay. We have um, some other commissioners that would like to be heard on this item. Commissioner Inman. 
Yeah, I, I think what the landowner is asking for is that Caltrans would not prevent them putting a sign in. So granted, they're going to have to get approvals from everybody you have to get an approval from to put a sign in. But is there a way uh, in their agreement for Caltrans to acknowledge that they would not prohibit the owner doing so? Uh, we, we will not prohibit the owner from doing so. The, the only other factor in this are, are the federal laws that prohibit, you know, signage. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and, you know, we, the going to have to. We, we, no, we, have no, we have no restriction. So we have no laws, but can you just document for the owner that they they would not be uh, prevented by Caltrans? I think that's um, what the, the owner can speak for himself. That's we can't leave. We can agree to that. I, I won't say we would put it in the actual document. We will certainly document that we do not restrict. Oh, could I comment again? Yes, please comment, sir. Um, yeah, she is right in that I, I, I would like it taken care of before I sign off on the agreement where uh, LADWP being Caltrans is acquiring the property on behalf of LADWP. If they could make that part of the negotiations between them, where um, Caltrans would um, get LADWP to agree to allow me to proceed in a non-restrictive manner on the on the easement. I I don't believe we, we certainly will continue to negotiate and look at this issue, but. I don't believe we can speak for the LADWP, and and you know, this is all theoretical at this point. We don't know what Mr. Noldner wants out there, and so uh, you know this is a third party here, the DWP. So we'll certainly look at at the uh, contract, and the department will not uh, interfere with his ability uh, or prohibit his ability to put things up. But we we can't speak for DWP, and I don't think we want to be between the property owner and DWP, uh, given this is all speculative at this time, since we don't know exactly what what uh, he has in mind. Okay, um, we have one more commissioner that would like to speak on this item, and that is Commissioner Liu. Yes, thank you. I guess I have uh, two, que uh, two questions, but I, I think the first one's easily answered, and that is that uh, negotiations over the terms of, of this agreement can and will continue if we adopt this uh, measure. That's that's correct, right? Absolutely. It, it's always the department's goal to come to agreement. That's better for all parties. That's that's fine. Thank you. My second question, however, has to do with this issue of one of the criteria that we're considering, and that is whether we're doing the um, the greatest uh, public benefit with the least public harm. And what I'm hearing from the property owner is that uh, he would like to continue to have an opportunity to put uh, these billboards uh, on what has been his property. And I'm wondering if the design of the project may need to be revised in order to accommodate the dual needs of DWP having access um, and an easement and his wish to of the billboards. Is there a need to perhaps provide more room um, along the proposed highway in order to do that? And if so, would that then um, provide greater public benefit and, and less public harm? Well, generally the greatest public benefit and specifically the least private harm is uh, achieved by minimizing the impacts to the property. And we've taken efforts to do that here so that we're freeing up as much of his parcel as possible. Um, for example, uh, this is in a fill area. So if we uh, we had designed the fills higher, we would have had to take up more property. So what we've done here is try to minimize the impacts to his property so that most of it is free and clear. We've also made efforts to minimize the uh, access easement because outside that access easement, it's, it's all his property. We we don't have any. There's no restrictions, or at least not none by the none by the department. So right. But what I think every effort to try to in this case, it, it may be that 
um, it, he has a, a greater interest and perhaps even a bigger easement if that's if he could reach agreement with DWP on it. So it, it might not be as straightforward in this case, it seems to me. Uh, okay, noted, yes. Um, well, at this point, these all are relative to compensation uh, and use of the par parcel. So we have made every effort again to try to minimize the impact and to free up as, uh, the parcel as much as possible, including retaining all the water rights under these acquisitions, which seem to be the main concern. Uh, Mr. Nolner's ability to pump water and then sell it downstream. So we have we have trans we will leave all water rights with with the property owner. Okay, commissioners, uh, these these have been uh, very thorough any, questions. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Kehoe again. So if I could just ask Mr. Whiteside, uh, with this action, we don't take uh, a, a a positive or a negative approach on the billboard issue, right? We are just approving the resolution of necessity, and I understand that there are some uh, details to still be negotiated. But that is, we're, not, that is we're, not directing, we're not directing Caltrans to uh, you know, sign off on uh, the possibility of, of a billboard, are we? No, no you, you, you are absolutely correct. We're just moving the project forward. We will continue negotiations. Uh, this action will allow us to uh, get this project in per schedule. Um, and uh, there are agreements that will be going back and forth between us and the property owner. But basically, you're, you're allowing the project to move forward while any other remaining issues are negotiated through, through uh, ultimately, the courts, if need be. Although, again, I want to emphasize the department's desire is always to come to settlement. Uh, going to court is our, our last option. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important clarification, Commissioner Kehoe, and I, I'm glad that you made it. Um, we now have a motion and a second. Uh, Terry, are we ready? Uh, the, is the item ready for us to take a vote and to have Douglas call the roll? Yes. Okay, thank you. Douglas, with that, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Davis. I recuse myself from the vote. Recuse or abstain, sir? Uh, abstain. Thank you. Com Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Eager? Yes. Commissioner Gardino? Yes. Commissioner Inman? Commissioner Inman? Commissioner Kehoe? Aye. Commissioner Liu? Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Vice Chair Norton. Aye. Vice Chair, the motion is approved. Wonderful. Um, we are going to move to item three, but we are going to cut item three off at 9.50 and resume after the presentation. Um, at 9.50, we will do the approval of minutes, and then I will be reading some rules of the road for public comment uh, because there are going to be a number of people who want to speak on the timed item and of uh, the 170 items that we have ahead of us today. Uh, with that, um, oh, can Terry, you could you please? Me? Uh, uh, this is Yvonne Burke. Somehow you don't hear me. We, we hear do you now. now. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> we you like to be recorded as what vote on this item too? I'm voting aye. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you so much. I tried to say something, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, with that, let's, uh, Terry, could you run us through um, motion and uh, item number three? Yes, I can. Commissioners, this run hearing was requested by the property owners, Timmis Taylor Family Limited Partnership, due to impacts to their property caused by a $52 million STIP project on State Route 156 in San Benito County. The main purpose of this project is to relieve congestion and improve traffic flow along the Route 156 transportation corridor between San Juan Bautista and Hollister in San Benito County. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask, are the property owners or representative online? And again, either raise your hand or speak up so that we know. OK. 
Okay. Um, if if there is, if if um, staff can let me know, I will continue on though at this time. Uh, the Taylor property is 898.86 acres zoned agricultural. The area required for this project is comprised of 68.93 acres of fee, 4.77 acres of permanent access easement, 1.92 acres of permanent utility easement, and one acre of temporary construction easement. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. One, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Two, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired nor deals with any issues other than the three just stated. Government code section 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed and the department has made the required offer. Um, again, at this time, are the property owners or representatives on the line? Okay, um, Commissioner, I would say um, absent that, I would um, go back to you and um, the commission to um, consider this resolution of necessity. Okay, uh, is there anything that uh, Mr. Whiteside would like to say also as part of this presentation? Um, well, and I think they have everything included in the public documents. Um, so if if there is a motion and then a need for any questions, we can direct that to the department. That's great. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion on item three? Commissioner Burke may be having trouble with her audio. This is Commissioner yes. Dunn. If, if she has not reached in, I'm happy to move the item. That would be great, Commissioner Dunn. Thank you. Do we I'm have a second? A second. Okay, great. Um, with that, uh, Commissioner Liu seconded. Uh, with that, Douglas, could you please read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Abstain, please. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Aye. Commissioner Gordino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye from Inman. Thank you. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Vice Chair Norton. Aye. Vice Chair, the motion is approved. Wonderful. With that, we will move on to item four. Terry? Sure. Um, commissioners, this Ron hearing was requested by property owners Michael and Jeanette Friedman due to impacts to their property caused by a $62 million SIP project on I-405 in Los Angeles um, County. The purpose of the project is to address increased traffic demand on I-405 with the construction of auxiliary lanes and a new on-ramp. Additionally, widening of the st city street is proposed to accommodate the traffic demand to the freeway. Um, again, at this time, I'd like to ask, are the property owners or a representative online? Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll keep going. And if, if they are, we can we can come back to that. Um, the Friedman property is 18,774 square feet, zone general commercial. Currently, it's improved with a retail building leased to coffee bean and tea leaf. The area required for this project is comprised of 335 square feet of fee and 1,376 square feet of temporary construction easement. The proposed area of fee take is within a landscaped area between two driveways. Um, under en eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three issues. 
does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? Is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Is the property necessary for the proposed project? And the commission neither deals with the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired nor deals with any issues other than the three stated. Government code section 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed and the department has made the required offer. Um, I will call to your attention, we did receive a letter from the property owner um, and it was sent out and part of the public documents um, it was sent out yesterday. Yes, I had that letter in front of us. Great. Um, and it sounds like we may, sorry, looking at text messages, this is a new world. Um, Michael Rubin is on. Um, so Michael, what I'll do is um, I would like to have Caltrans, um, Mike Whiteside has prepared a presentation. And so we'll have him do his presentation and then we'll go to you, Michael, to um, hear from you. So Mike Whiteside. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Terry. Uh, for the third case today, uh, this is for a project located on the San Diego freeway. That's the I-405 in Los Angeles. The property is owned by Michael and Jeanette Friedman, the Friedman Trust, and a coffee bean franchise operates on the site. Next. So here the project again is outlined in, outlined in blue. Uh, the project is sponsored by LO, LA Metro and the city of Torrance. Caltrans is doing the work as, a, as a, under a reimbursement agreement with LA Metro. Uh, the project received a finding of no significant impact in June of 2016 through the environmental process. Next. So here blue outlines the limits of the project. Uh, there's work both on the interstate and on the city streets. Next. Specifically uh, around the intersection of 182nd Street and Crenshaw Boulevard, which is where the parcel is located. That's highlighted in green there in the red circle. Next. Again, the project's purpose is to reduce congestion and improve operations uh, and improve route continuity on both the city streets and on the interstate. Next. So zooming into the area around the parcel. Next. The parcel again is in green. Uh, in this area, we're improving existing ramps that are shown in blue here. We're adding some new ramps shown in red and the yellow indicates uh, some new right turn pockets uh, in several locations on the city street including just there on the corner of the subject parcel, which of course is again in green. You see there's a small yellow dot or a shape there at the corner. Next. So why do we need this parcel? Um, there are two safety concerns. Next, if we construct just part of the project and do not touch the Friedman parcel, next, then cars and trucks crossing uh, Crenshaw Boulevard on 182nd Street will have to swerve to stay in their lanes. That's called an offset. Uh, this is a safety concern. Vehicles could head into oncoming traffic. Next. But if we complete the project as proposed, next, then the lanes line up, uh, cars won't have to swerve to stay in their lanes, and it's less likely that a vehicle might go into oncoming traffic. So the first reason we need to touch this parcel is to avoid creating that offset. Next. The second safety concern is right turning trucks. Uh, you'll notice up in the upper left corner, there is a uh, truck in the picture. Next. So for that truck to make the turn, they have to straddle the adjacent lanes. This creates a conflict that I've circled here in red. Um, so the truck is swerving into or straddling the lanes and it's a safety concern because often cars try to jockey to get around that. And the, the trucks need to do that to safely make turns in the existing condition. Next. But if we improve the sidewalk, what we're doing there shown in blue now is just pulling that sidewalk back. Next. That requires a fee of 300, 335 square feet and about a 1400 foot temporary construction easement needed to construct that new sidewalk. Next. So now we've, if we complete the project per plan, the trucks can make that right turn and they are not 
uh, having straddled the lanes, and we have eliminated that safety concern. Next. So here's a ground view of the existing uh, intersection. We're looking north on Crenshaw with 182nd Street is the cross street. Uh, notice that the signal pole will be re relocated and the overhead utilities, those are power utilities, will be put underground. Next. So this is a simulation, not a great one, but a simulation of what we're planning to do. And that is just to pull that sidewalk back uh, to allow the trucks to make that turn. Um, the project won't impact parking spots and the driveways will remain open during daylight hours throughout construction. Next. And here we're looking the other direction. Next. Again, I wanna emphasize the parking spaces are unaffected. Uh, we will have to have the coffee bean sign will have to be relocated. Uh, the driveways aren't affected during daylight hours uh, and the overhead utilities will be removed. Next. So the department has been acting as an intermediary between the owners and the city of Torrance to address their concerns and answer their questions. This has been oh, about a year and a half we've been in discussion. I won't go into the details here, but uh, I can answer questions if you have any. Next. So there's just a few remaining issues um, related to the findings of the commission. The property owner contends that under lease private injury, we should avoid the parcel altogether. We can keep the current alignment and trucks are fine making the right turn now. Next. I just briefly want to remind you that if we don't touch that parcel, we are creating an offset, which is a potentially dangerous situation. Next. And that currently, trucks making that right turn do conflict with adjacent lanes. Next. So the department's response is we need to touch the parcel for safety. This project eliminates the offset and turning conflicts that will exist if we don't build her plan. Uh, the department has looked at the design, had several alternatives, and we are only acquiring the minimum to build a safe project. Next. Next, the property owner contends that they don't want to be involved with the re-landscaping and other restorative work on their property after we're done with our construction. They want the department to hire landscape architects, acquire permits, hire contractors, oversee the construction, relocate signage, possibly elevate a sign and to add signage, to reconfigure their parking to reclaim some of the landscape area lost, or to include all of this work in our greater construction contract. Uh, in other words, they, they've requested to be completely hands off. Next. The department's response is that no matter who does the work, there's no way for the owners to be completely removed from the process. The owners must be involved. Next. The city requires the owners to file for permits for work on the property. Caltrans can't pull the permits for them for the post-construction work on their parcel. Next. This work will require negotiations with the tenant. Uh, the department believes it's ill-advised for us to come between the owners and their tenants. Uh, we haven't seen their lease, but it will undoubtedly have terms and conditions that impact the post-construction work on that parcel. The department isn't a party to the lease, and we're not in a position to enforce the lease. Next. To ensure the property owner gets what they want, it's best if they control the work done on their parcel. Next. The department has coordinated with the city to answer as many of the owner's questions as possible. However, the city has even indicated that they would rather speak to the property owners and not with the department. Next. Uh, fulfilling this request would set a precedent. On average, the department acquires over 800 parcels a year. If we begin re-landscaping and doing other post-construction work for owners, the department will require a significant increase in staffing, which we're not reaching for. Next, <clears throat> lease private injury refers to the entire project and applies to minimizing impacts to the physical property. All projects, we under, we know all projects, uh, cause inconvenience to impacted property owners. Recognizing that the impacts of the property owner can't be avoided and that the owners must be involved, the, par the department will pay just compensation to the owners. So ultimately, uh, the department believes this is a compensation issue. Mr. Whiteside, um, as promised, I need to 
uh, pause this and we're gonna come back to this item after 11.30 today because we have other time sensitive items that are scheduled for specific time. Okay? Very good. <laughs> I'll so, be here thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Um, with that, um, we'd like to take items five, six, and seven together. They are the approval of the minutes for the April meeting and the May meeting and the commissioner meetings for compensation. Could we please have a, a motion on these three items taken together? This is Commissioner Gordino. I would move items five, six, and seven. Great. Do we have a second? Inman will second. Wonderful. Um, Douglas, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Abstain, please. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Abstain. Commissioner Gordino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni. Aye. Vice Chair Norton. Aye. Vice Chair, the motion is approved. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, uh, the prelude to item 17, which is our timed item beginning at 10, I want to go over some rules of the road about public comment and participation. So um, welcome to the June 2020 CTC virtual meeting. Uh, the CTC exists to make transportation planning, funding, and policy more understandable and accountable. Our meetings normally take place in diverse locations around the state so that commissioners can see firsthand the variety of infrastructure issues around California. However, containment measures surrounding COVID-19 has required us to adjust into a webinar format. Please practice grace and empathy today. Everyone is doing their best to make the best of a very difficult situation. The commission's meeting agenda is located under the handouts tab and can be downloaded and saved during the webinar. It can also be found on the commission's website. A webinar instructional guide is also located under the handouts tab and on the commission's website. If you are experiencing any technical issues with the GoToWebinar system, please contact the commission staff through the questions tab or via the CTC email address. For commissioners, should commissioners have any questions or comments during the meeting, please let staff know through the comment tab or via text to Mitch and wait for me to call on you. You can also send inquiries to the questions tab that can be read to the audience on your behalf. Please mute your microphone except when you intend to speak to minimize outside noise and feedback. I will do my best to call on each of you in turn. Because this meeting is not an in-person meeting, every vote will need to be a roll call vote. Staff will group items for votes to help save time. A commissioner should only speak when called upon. When called upon, please state your name and briefly make your point. And I would please ask that no one speak a second time on any one motion until everyone who wishes to speak at the first time has done so. For presenters, if you are on the agenda to make a presentation, please do your best to be succinct. Again, we have 170 items today. And for the public, we welcome comments for the public. For participants joining us through the GoToWebinar system, please find the webinar panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. There you will find the audio question and handout tabs. Under the audio tab, attendees will have the choice to listen in via the computer or telephone option. Should you prefer a computer audio, please ensure that the appropriate box is selected. If you choose the phone call option, select the corresponding box and dial the phone number, access code, and audio pin as directed by the automated system. Please note, that if the audio pin is not entered, you will remain in listen-only mode and will be unable to speak to the commission should you have a comment. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided a unique link and phone number to access the webinar. These cannot be shared with the other participants as they are registered to a specific attendee. There are two options for participants to provide comments on agenda items. One, using the questions tab, type in the agenda item you are commenting on and your comment. Commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. Alternately, you may click on the hand icon to indicate you wish to make a comment. You will then be unmuted and called upon to make your comment. Please be sure to state your name and affiliation prior to voicing your remarks. Please do your best to be concise with your comments. 
Also, please make sure that your comments add new information. If you agree with the comments of a previous speaker, simply make that statement. Since we often only have many speakers, we request that you make your point in three minutes or less. If, for some reason, we have many speakers on a topic, I reserve the right to limit comments to one minute. With that, I'm delighted to have us have a very weighty item today, and that is a transportation equity overview. And uh, Brigitte, I think our speaker is going to be appearing as close to 10 a.m. as possible. Will you let us know when he has um, signed in? Commissioner Norton, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Charles Brown is on the line. Um, oh. But uh, I think I have a question for Doug. Um, because this is a timed item, um, can we start the item now, or do we need to wait until 10 a.m. promptly? Well, I have some um, uh, introductory comments, so I can maybe do those, and so his actual presentation can start at the 10 a.m. time. Douglas, okay. did you want to give a comment? Okay. So with that, and and uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for being here early. Um, before calling on staff to introduce you, I'd like to make a few introductory remarks. Enhancing the lives of all Californians by connecting individuals to jobs, healthcare, education, and other opportunities lies at the heart of what we do and why here at the CTC. While California faces equity gaps, racial inequality, civil unrest, budget reduction, double-digit unemployment, and the effects of the climate crisis, Investing in a strong statewide transportation network can, thankfully, be part of the solution to all of these challenges. Transportation plays an important role in bridging inequality as strong mobility is an empowerment tool, creating new career-making jobs, providing access to new jobs in education, promoting racial and economic equity, improving health and air quality, enhancing safety, and enhancing community identity. In closing, I want to emphasize that while today's discussion is informational, it is the first in a series of items on this issue, and I will be making a presentation and discussion about um, upcoming hearings that we will conduct. I also want to say that I've heard Mr. Brown speak before at a UCLA conference, and he is very powerful, and I'm looking forward, as are all of us, to his presentation today. With that, Brigitte, please introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Vice Chair Norton. Tab 17 is an informational item to provide an overview of transportation equity. Charles P. Brown is an expert on transportation equity and will provide this presentation. Mr. Brown is the founder and managing principal of Equitable Cities, LLC a nationally known urban planning, policy, and research firm working at the intersection of transportation, health, and equity. He also serves as a senior researcher with the Alan M. Voorhees Transportation Center and is an adjunct professor at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy, both at Rutgers University. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Brown for his presentation. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, uh, the Commission. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll keep it short with the introduction. Uh, I know we're limited on time, so I can get through with the presentation. Today, I would like to discuss why equity matters, uh, creating a safe, equitable, and inclusive transportation system for all. Next slide. In order to do so, first we must uh, ground ourselves in a uh, definition of what is intended by equity. And so what I've done here is listed three key points to understand uh, what I intend when I speak specifically about equity. First and foremost, equity involves trying to give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. Secondly, and most importantly for CTC and its partners, is that equity is the presence of justice and fairness within the procedures the processes and distribution of resources by institutions or systems like yourself. But lastly, on an individual as well as a systemic level, 
Equity issues requires an understanding of the underlying or root causes of inequalities and oppression within society. Next slide. But equity requires that you also go a bit deeper and you consider the intersectionalities that, was, that exist within society as well as within individuals. In doing so, it is important to ask yourself a series of questions. Which identities do you think about most often? Which identities do you think about least often? Which of your own identities would you like to learn more about? And which of these identities have the strongest effect on how you perceive yourself? And then lastly, which of these identities have the greatest effect on how you perceive others? This is important because equity requires an intentionality around not being ahistorical or not being apolitical. Next slide. And as we talk through this, it has been widely noted, and I've gone on record of saying, once we look at equity through a lens that is not ahistorical, that is not apolitical, what we start to see is that transportation in many ways at all levels and systems of government has been weaponized as a tool of oppression within society, a tool of oppression specifically around who has mobility option and who does not. Next slide. This is evident across the country when you look at how we place highways, how we've directed res uh, resources to uh, increase access for cars and other mobility options, whether it's historic Treme in New Orleans or many of the communities that exist within California. Next slide. It also shows up in the data. Smart Growth America does a report looking at, uh, it's called Dangerous by Design, looking at how dangerous it is for pedestrians uh, to walk in many places across the country. And what that report found really quickly is that if you're an older adult, a person of color, or if people walk within low-income communities, you are disproportionately more likely to be represented in fatal crashes. Next slide. When it comes to older adults, their relative pedestrian da danger index was more than a third higher than the general population. Next slide. When it came to people of color between 2008 and 2017, when this data was looked at, black and African-Americans were 72% more likely to have been struck and killed by drivers while walking. Next slide. And then lastly, those people living or persons living in households where the medium household income is 36,000 or less, they were killed at a much higher rate than their counterparts. Well, why is this important? This is important for multiple reasons. It's not just the people that are living there who are dying. It's also the people that are traversing through these neighborhoods. And regardless of our social status, many of us find ourselves each day traversing through these neighborhoods. So if one doesn't have empathy for the communities that are dying, we would hope that they would have enough concern about their own safety to ensure that these conditions are improved to make it safe for them and their families as well. Next slide. There's also environmental impacts. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I've experienced uh, two very uh, horrific events uh, in modern history, one being Hurricane Katrina. Next slide. The other being Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey. Next slide. Thankfully, uh, the public health agencies across the country in the Bay Area as well are starting to now see the connection between these social identities that I spoke about or inequities that I spoke about and their connections to institutional inequities, living condition, risk behavior, disease, and mortality. Prior to them taking a look at this, many people focused on downstream, which is what are the risky behavior that these individuals are engaged in without taking a look at the living conditions that made it possible for that risky behavior to result in an injury or a fatality, or the role that institutions were playing that helped to create the living conditions for these populations. Next slide. So what we're starting to see right now as a continuation and why this is important, here is a map of Houston, Texas. What you see is blue represents white, green represents black, purple represents Hispanic, the other colors represent the other um, races and ethnicities within the Houston area. If blue represents white and green represents black, what do you see in this map? Next slide. 
Here's a map of Atlanta where you see the same thing. The question to you is, if blue represents white and green represents black, what do you see? Next slide. Here's a map of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. If blue represents white and green represents black, what do you see? Next slide. And then here's a map of Portland, Oregon. If blue represents white, green represents black, purple represents Hispanic, what do you see? I think it's obvious right now that what you see is racial residential segregation, which is the main or one of the main driving forces behind the inequities that we see in society today. Next slide. And so what you find then is that what the health world is starting to see, as well as transportation, is that race determines your place, which determines one's health. Next slide. So with that being said, history doesn't say goodbye. History says see you later. And what does later look like right now in the state or context of California? Next slide. We know based on the uh, report, the results of the Dangerous by Design report by Smart Growth America, California is the 16th most dangerous state for pedestrians in the country. Next slide. So how can we create a safe, equitable, and inclusive system for all? I'm going to go through an equity and a justice framework to show you how to do this. Next slide. First, what we must consider are uh, five approaches to justice. These are ways in which the commission and other partners throughout the state can assess if they are creating justice in our public safe, in our public places, as well as in the processes in which we go about making decisions. Next slide. The first question we must ask whenever we uh, make any decisions within the transportation context is, who has physical access to that street, to that park, or to that trail? Asking that question along the lines of who in person, as well as across modalities, whether it's bikes, buses, trains, or cars, is a form of getting at is distributive justice present in this decision-making process. Next slide. My research showed me that most respondents do not feel safe uh, for their children biking, to um, biking within their neighborhoods. So if the children do not feel safe and we're not engaging with the parents of those children to see how, it, to see to what degree they're not feeling safe, this is a concern. Next slide. Another example of this, my research showed that only or nearly one in four uh, participants felt safe biking to their local parks and trails from their homes. Next slide. So now we've taken a look at distributive justice. The next thing we must consider is procedural justice. Who has influence over the design, the operations, and the programming of our transportation systems? Next slide. And what my research has shown me is that minority, minority youth, black, brown, or otherwise, are not involved in the planning and the decision-making processes, but many of them find themselves victims of our vehicle, vehicle and pedestrian crashes. Next slide. Then we move into inter, interactional justice, which begs the question, who, what makes people feel welcome or unwanted in a particular space? Next slide. As you may or may not know, African Americans are two and a half times more likely to be, be killed by law enforcement, and males in the studies that I've done reported being stopped at a rate seven times that of female. Next slide. Then we move into representational justice. Do people feel their experience and their history is represented in a particular space? Next slide. What my research has shown and other documents throughout the country showing is that too often um, there, there is historical and cultural ratio that takes place in communities across this country when we are planning transportation systems, um, that go through communities of color, whether they be black or brown communities, oftentimes the historical and the cultural ration takes place and it is overwhelming to these communities and their experiences. Next slide. So then lastly, what we must do is consider care. How do people demonstrate their care for that space and other people in it? Next slide. 
My research shows that our systems have been historically biased against women and do not protect religious minority groups. So if we are to ensure an equitable and inclusive transportation system, we must make sure that it is not biased against women and it does protect religious minority groups. Next slide. So here are a series of recommendations that or strategies that I would like to put forth to the commission. Um, the first one is that the commission, as well as its partners, put on record its stance of becoming an anti-racist organization complete with values and culture that make that clear to everyone involved. It's not just enough to say that we're going to uh, do these ex equity strategies. One must go on record and state and put in place a culture that it is not that it is anti-racist. Next, I think it's imperative that the commission adopt a racial equity action plan so that it could benchmark today the efforts that have been done and then report progress on those efforts in the future in a very transparent way. Thirdly, I think the equity should engage in a series of equity-based trainings, not only the commission itself, but also the staff that is um, a part of the commission as well. Then it is important for the equity to develop a series of performance measures. Again, if you're doing some ben benchmarking, there must be a system in place that we could see how well things are or have been improving over time. Next, I think it's important to develop an internal equity group. This is important because as staff learns that or ways in which equity is impacting um, communities across California every single day. Uh, it's important that this equity approach has been institutionalized in a way that staff wants to carry it forward and they're given the means to do so. But then lastly, I think for accountability purposes and transparency purposes, it's not just enough to do an internal equity group. It's also important to have an external equity advisory group. I've been fortunate to meet some uh, and work with some amazing organizations across the state of California. They include Cal Bikes, Cal Walks, Climate Plan, Transport, Transform, and many, many others. I think having an external equity advisory group to work with the commission would be a great start at ensuring that the organization becomes anti-racist, the organization prioritizes equity, and the organization is held accountable for its decision-making processes. Next slide. But in doing so, I would hope that we all remember that these positive transportation investments sometimes have an unintentional impact on different communities. And I'll leave you with, a, with two quotes. First being, please remember that trees planted in minority communities mature just in time for gentrification to take place. So your investments are going to have some positive benefits, but those benefits may look different in different communities as well as the burdens. Next slide. And as I close here with my time, please never forget that this work around equity and justice is about love. It's about love for self, it's about love for community, and love for this country. So never forget that justice is what love looks like in, per in public. Next slide. Here's my contact information. I want to thank the commission for giving me an opportunity to do this virtually. I would have loved the opportunity to do this in person, but thank you for your time. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, for another very moving and powerful presentation. As I stated in my remarks, this is just the beginning of the Commission's focus on transportation equity, but we know we only have you here until 11 a.m., so I wanted to get to Commissioner questions and public comment right away. Uh, with that, I know Commissioner Liu had already said he wanted to speak on this item, and if you, the other commissioners could please tell Mitch when you would like to speak, um, I will call on you next. Commissioner Liu. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Brown, for that presentation. It was uh, incredible, very good. I, I uh, think it was very spot on. I, my questions 
have uh, more to do with staff and our response to the issues that you've identified and the recommendations that you've made. Uh, so I would like to ask staff, because I've been talking with Mitch and others, if um, they could explain their plans for the establishment of a transportation um, equity advisory group and also uh, how they feel about the strategies and recommendations made by Mr. Brown. I also have the follow up to uh, if I could. Mitch? Mayor Lou, I believe yes. that we have Deputy Director Hello. Garth Hopkins on the line to respond to that question. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning again. My name is Garth Hopkins. I'm the Deputy Director for Planning at the California Transportation Commission. And, and thank you, Commissioner Lou, for your question. Uh, I just want to say in regards to, you know, the Commission does acknowledge the need to address transportation equity issues. Um, that have resulted from past decisions when the Highway Commission was in existence, and then also to ensure that current funding decisions do not disproportionately impact uh, the state's most vulnerable communities. So under the direction of the Vice Chair and the Executive Director, staff has started efforts to ensure that the Commission addresses equity in our policies and procedures. Commission staff has begun the following efforts aimed at addressing transportation equity issues. First, um, Recognizing the need for the Commission to further understand the needs of our state's more, most vulnerable communities, Commission staff has started to outline a series of seven regional listening sessions. However, due to the pan current pandemic, these will be conducted via webinar. And primarily the purpose of these listening sessions will be um, we'll hold these seven listening sessions to learn from community members you know, I'll get a, gain a better understanding of what their equity related issues are. Um, and in addition to the listening sessions, the Commission staff will convene um, roundtable sessions that will focus on specific topics relating to transportation equity. These roundtables will allow community leaders to provide their perspectives in more detail. Commission staff plan to use this uh, to inform our next steps and then also to help inform the scope of the listening sessions and recommendations that guide the discussion of an equity advisory committee. We anticipate that these roundtables would take place between October and January. Um, staff will be able to report back um, at our March meeting regarding further efforts relating to the commission could undertake to address equity. And more specifically, staff intends to come back to the August commission meeting outlining these steps in more detail. And with that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate that. I, I also have some recommendations based off my own experience. I've uh, I've had far too many years of experience serving on and chairing various environmental justice advisory groups at the Air Resources Board, Cal EPA, and the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And based on all these years of experience, I would recommend when we think of an external advisory group that we think about what tasks we would like it to achieve. Um, and I think it's they're more productive if you actually give them something to do. And the tasks that I would like them to consider, uh, obviously in addition to the uh, recommendations of Mr. Brown, but the and we have talked about this, and Mitch has mentioned it a couple of times, the development of a guidebook for public participation uh, in transportation decision-making in California, I think would be helpful for more than just our most impacted communities and our communities of color in California, but it would be helpful for everyone. And um, I think uh, I would also like to recommend that our an equity advisory group um, take a look at the, the production of a transportation equity needs assessment report. Um, much of what I think would go into a needs assessment report was covered in Mr. Brown's presentation. So he's, he might have done a lot of that work for us already. Um, however, I think they, uh, that our own group might find some other things that they would like to mention in terms of needs. And I, would, I think that it would also be helpful if we would set a goal of having this group recommend a list of um, transportation equity policies, practices, and action items for us. Thank and you. finally, when we do get back to meeting in person, which I do hope happens someday, that we ask our equity advisory group to organize and host uh, transportation equity tours of their communities 
so that we can all get a firsthand view of um, what they see as the problems with regard to transportation and equity. These environmental justice type tours that I've participated in for decades have really made an impact on people. And, and once you've seen it, it's not something you can easily or ever forget. So I would uh, ask for uh, an advisory group to provide assistance in doing these kind of tours. So thank, thank you. you. Mr. I, I, that, that concludes my comments. These, these were many of the recommendations that I plan to be talking about in, in the conversation that we had in, in my commission report. We want to make sure that the commission's questions right now, while we only have um, Mr. Brown's time until 11, that we can um, use this time to, to speak to Mr. Brown, and then we can go back to talking about what we want to do as a commission um, while we also have the public to hear from. So thank you very much for your input, Commissioner Liu, and we'll be talking about that um, further. Uh, next, I'd like to have Commissioner Inman. Yeah, I just want to build on what Commissioner Liu was saying and, and also Vice Chair Norton. But on the slide, the equity um, number two, I think that image is from the UCLA Arrowhead Conference. And what that reminds, and I love that conference, um, what it reminds me is of the power of partnership. So um, I really want us to be um, inclusionary of our academic resources and the work that's been done and build on that. And then what I have struggled with about the Arrowhead Conference is that we all go and we listen and we learn and we spend time together and then we go back and do whatever we do. So I think looking at the tools we have, we have this conference and there are others, but how do we really translate those into our actions is the big question uh, that I have. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, Mr. Brown, did you wanna comment on what uh, Commissioner Inman said in terms of lasting change and some recommendations along those lines? Yes, uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, comment on what Commissioner Liu has has said as well. I think uh, the plan that he laid out in addition to the strategies and recommendations I've listed here is a very dynamic and needed one within the commission. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner Liu, for those acknowledgements. I think they're right on. Uh, when it comes to um, Commissioner Ian, uh, absolutely right that a lot of uh, lip service happens at many of these meetings that we attend. However, I think if the the commission can start with first uh, stating that it will be an anti-racist organization uh, in a document that will be great, that it that is an action-oriented step. In addition to doing these trainings, these performance measures, all of these things are necessary to institutionalize equity and justice within the commission uh, and to create a solid foundation of which you can build upon. By engaging with the external uh, advisory uh, committee, giving them something to do, as Commissioner Lou said, I think that could be a part of achieving what is meant by moving beyond lip service because they, er, the things that they would do would be action oriented and can help guide the commission. So I agree, and I think these are ways to start that. These are the most foundational and important ways to start that process. Thank you so much, and I and I appreciate that you are supportive of the um, the hearings and the proposal that Garth Hopkins talked about, which had been worked on with myself and the CTC staff to make sure that we had these listening sessions and convening the equity roundtables and guiding an equity advisory committee. I really appreciate that, Mr. Brown, and thank you for reminding us that we add to, need to add the anti-racist statement as part of the work of the commission when we come back. Um, Commissioner Davis, I know you had some questions. Well, a comment more than a question, just that, and I think you, you did reference that we're gonna talk about these uh, hearing hearing panels and participation from the board level. And I just would say that I would wanna participate in those uh, as much as I possibly can. I mean, my organization is a majority minority organization um, and uh, all of the, items that uh, Mr. Brown discussed uh, impact uh, some of the 60,000 members that I have in California uh, on a daily basis. And I would want to make every effort I can to try to help make, make a change there. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Commissioner Dunn, you had a yes, I, yes, I have a question for Mr. Brown. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I think uh, every organization um, that happens to be engaged uh, is uh, grappling with this and how to listen deeply and also then how to act and maybe finally try to get it right. Um, so I really appreciate your uh, equity strategies and recommendations. Do you have a, uh, a portfolio of success stories where other organizations, other states, other, or, uh, other groups have implemented your six bullet points and uh, if there's a report or what their uh, successes, challenges, et cetera, were that we might, as, as we contemplate this, be able to learn from and move forward uh, with? The, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, for instance, I can provide uh, a sources for organizations who have taken on an anti-racist approach, absolutely. Uh, whether or not it has been successful, I cannot follow up with um, a source for that because many organizations who adopt these strategies don't always uh, do the work to see if they've been successful or not because that requires an additional step. Uh, when it comes to the racial equity action plan, you have uh, the city of Oakland who's already done one in California and they continue to do it very successfully. Uh, equity trainings, absolutely. Equity performance measures, absolutely. Internal equity group, yes. And then external equity advisory groups, I would say yes, I can provide examples. But again, it's very difficult uh, to provide an example along with the successes as well as uh, the challenges. But if you were to engage with your partners there in the state of California, many of them may have access to citations and sources to prove or disprove the credibility of these recommendations um, themselves. So I think that's the, the beauty of these partnerships and working with these groups because many of them have already been doing this work in the state of California. I'm just happy here to be a voice on their behalf and the behalf of the residents in the state. Thank you. I, I think that's where we're looking to go is uh, to build on past successes uh, again so we can move this forward and not just have more talk but actually produce action that is meaningful. Um, so thank you for that and, and I would certainly appreciate uh, uh, you know learning from your um, you know, uh, your, your thing, the things that you've learned from working on those six strategies. Yes. Commissioner Thank Dunn, you. If, you, if you don't mind, uh, one note of, um, one, one caveat or a note of caution. Uh, oftentimes we look for prior successes and things that just simply have not taken place. Yes. Uh, for instance, uh, it could be that the commission are going to set uh, are going to be the go-to organization for ways to do this successfully. So I caution us in looking for evidence-based work that was successful because as we understand the implications of equity, not many people have done it well. So it may be that you are becoming the best practice by doing this work. And I hope that you all would approach it with that thinking in mind as well, that you may set the bar for everyone else. Point well taken. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. We, we aspire to set the bar for this equity work, and we thank you for your advice to do so. Uh, commissioners, are there any other commissioners that would like to um, ask questions uh, before we go to the public? Uh, I, Yvonne Burke would like to ask a question. Of course, Commissioner Burke. Uh, I, I guess uh, you can't see that I raised my hand. I have shared my feelings with with Mitch that uh, unfortunately over the years we had uh, very few staff members in the commission. Uh, we now have uh, certainly uh, two or three uh, African American uh, staff people, and our responsibilities ordinarily are granting project approval. Uh, and I personally, over the years, have felt that the lack of uh, 
racial sensitivity in terms of those projects uh, had an impact statewide. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think I welcome this uh, whole ability to look at equity and strategies and also an evaluation of our, uh, our staffing and how we can broaden our staff to include a full measure of people of every ethnic background. That's a wonderful point that I believe Mitch is going to address. Yeah, uh, and uh, Commissioner, I, I completely agree. Uh, one of the one of the conversations uh, Chief Deputy Director Taylor, Taylor and I have had about this subject is really how few uh, black people we have we have interviewed in the course of our career. In fact, I think since I've been, I've been at the commission, there have only been three, and I've hired two of them. So what, uh, what a couple of things we've talked about about how, in, in terms of how we might move forward on that is uh, how we can reach out to nearby universities when we're looking for student assistance as a potential pipeline for to get people working at the commission and then have an opportunity to move up into higher level policy positions and then management positions. Um, we've also talked about the need to, again, when schools are, are back in session, how can we as transportation professionals start going out to even kids at the high school level and talk about what we do and let them know that that this is a career, that this is an opportunity where people can make a difference um, and have them start thinking about that uh, at an even younger age. Um, I'd also, uh, since I have the mic, like to address a few of the, the, the recommendations uh, that are up here and, and update the, the commission on some of the things uh, we've been doing. Um, first of all, we have formed an internal equity advisory group to uh, start helping staff and guide us going forward. In July, all commission staff will participate in a series of professional trainings on equity that will provide staff with education on the history of race and class in America, as well as tools for understanding bias and navigating privilege and power. In August, the commission staff will join other state agencies participating in the Capital Collaborative on Race and Equity, which provides training, networking, and assistance for agencies working to achieve racial equity. And then as Commis Commissioner Liu mentioned, we are beginning to develop a public engagement guide to demystify the transportation planning and decision-making process for all Californians so that the process can be more inclusive and effective. Thank you. Uh, may I just add one thing? Please. Uh, I, I think that uh, our experience as a commission has been uh, influenced so much by Caltrans. And Caltrans does not have a great record in terms of upward mobility, in terms of African American. I'm sorry. Uh, as far as African Americans, uh, generally, I think that Caltrans has an excellent uh, a record in terms of other minorities. It's just African Americans that often are not seen at the higher levels of Caltrans. So I think that we have to also bring Caltrans into our approach and our, the studies that we make and however we approach many of these issues. And I'm very sorry for the noise. Um, Not a problem. Thank, thank you so much for that important input, Commissioner Burke, and for your lifelong legacy of leadership in civil rights and um, black empowerment. Thank you so much for these really important remarks from your wonderful perspective. I wanted to ask if there are others who uh, also wanted to add your remarks before we go to public comment. Thank, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Norton. This is Commissioner Gordino. Uh, and I wanted to wait to speak um, because I really view this as an opportunity to first listen and learn and only then to lead um, as as a caucasian middle-aged male uh, i recognize that both personally and professionally i have much to learn from this effort and as we are doing through my uh, work uh, for my day job on these same vital issues 
And that approach is guiding our work to listen, learn, and then lead. Uh, what I am excited about what has been shared today um, and the direction that it seems like hopefully we are going is uh, what, what I refer to as uh, speak up that's uh, making it clear uh, that our organization uh, will be an anti-racist organization. But that's only the first part. It's a critical part, but it's only the first part, as was so wonderfully articulated earlier. We also have to stand up and step up. Uh, stand up for me is what we expect from others in a way that we are helping to lift other people up. But what we have is our own clear expectations. And then step up is what we are going to do as a commission of commissioners and professional staff relative to our own internal efforts. So I want to thank you all for uh, leading us uh, as we uh, then lead uh, down uh, this direction as a commission. Thank you, Vice Chair Norton. Thank you very much. Are there any other statements from commissioners uh, before we go to the public? Okay, with that, um, are there any public comments on this item? Yes, we have um, Naila Pope-Hardin, who would like to be unmuted. Naila, you're now self-muted. You're free to speak. Uh, all right, Naila Pope-Hardin with Climate Plan here. Um, I'd like to say, well, sports are out, and so I guess I got all of my rooting and cheering in during this presentation that I would have um, for my favorite sports mm -hmm. team. <laughs> Definitely appreciate, Mr. Brown, everything you said about anti-racist statements, advancing equity, and the commission needs to do more than performative measures. To the commission, we really appreciate uh, the work the staff has been doing towards creating an equity advisory committee, and we really hope that this presentation adds fire um, to the work that we're already doing, and we can continue to partner together um, to create an equity advisory committee. And also, um, just hope that we do more than listening sessions, and there is a tangible outcome that leads to more equitable, safer, and cleaner uh, transportation system. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Thanks. Yes, we also have Chanel Fletcher. Chanel, go ahead. Hi, um, I, I want to echo everything that Naila said. I think I fully support that. I think there are a couple of things that I'll just say, and I unfortunately uh, speak very candidly, so I will say this very candidly and also have the caveat that I'm ha more than happy to talk with um, any commissioners or any staff about these things, and I think both Mitch and Tanisha know that about me. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think to be an anti-racist um, agency, I think you need to commit to um, being anti-racist yourself. And so I think there does need to be a deep interrogation of how um, the CTC, how Caltrans, how other agencies and entities have perpetuated um, racism, whether it was intentional or not. And then I think that's the place that you start from. And then I think there's an active effort of like, how do we address that? And so I know that at one point, the CTC was looking for um, an equity consultant that got pulled. But that is something that I would say that, you know, as you're thinking about this, um, and as you're starting to contemplate like what that means to be anti-racist, I think doing that deep kind of interrogation of your own practices and policies is gonna be necessary to make that happen. The other thing that I probably wanted to elevate and say is that um, I think with these listening sessions, this is my first time hearing them. Um, and I know that we've had conversations with staff multiple points. And so I think to um, the points that were being raised in this presentation, which I was fully supportive of, use i think that like internal equity advisory committee like use like leadership council climate plan california walks california bike like you know coalition for clean air like use us as a resource i think a lot of us have um relationships with these communities a lot of us were part of, were part of like listening sessions previously that were held and that maybe weren't as effective like i think we are here to help and we want to and we have been pushing for this for a long time so um, instead of kind of being like, whoa, surprise, there's going to be listening sessions, it would have been great to kind of 
know that and to feel like we are again like co-creating and co-collaborating on these things. Um, and I think the final point that I would say, um, I don't know where my time is at, but I think for the point around Lake Arrowhead, um, I was at the last one on transportation equity and I don't know how many commissioners attended that, but I know that a number of um, black people, you know, people of color, like all of us felt very much like unseen and unheard. And I think that was a point for UCLA to do some deep work in terms of like, whoa, what happened here? And I think part of what that is, is that if you're creating and developing things without actually working with the people that are most impacted, you are, you're going to have that problem of, wait, we didn't do it quite right. And I think that's why, again, go back to the piece of like, co-collaboration, co-creation is essential if this is where the CTC wants to go. Um, and I'm very, very happy to, um, to talk with, to work with, and I think the same is for Naila and all the organizations that I listed. Like, we are all very happy to be a part of that, but um, I just really wanted to emphasize that if this is something that the CTC is really interested in and it doesn't want to be a performative, you know, action, we really need to see that happen. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, we will speak to that in, in later reports, uh, but thank you very much for that comment. Um, are there other public comments today? Yes, we um, also have Jonathan Matz who wanted to speak. Jonathan, go ahead. Hi, thank you. My name is Jonathan Matz. I'm California Senior Policy Manager of the Safe Routes Partnership. Um, I also uh, wanted to echo the, the um, sentiments of uh, my uh, colleagues Naila and Chanel, um, Professor Brown, I first had the pleasure of seeing you speak at the uh, Calox Peds Conference, I believe it was in 2018, and um, was really enlightened. And um, I, I only wish uh, that we had the time during this meeting to to um, have the full breadth of uh, presentations like that one, which you know, I know even then only capture a small segment of, uh, of your work. So um, I uh, and certainly encouraged by the, the commission making time um, for um, a succinct overview of uh, concepts in, in transportation equity, uh, as we just saw right now. Um, I also want to echo the points of, of Chanel that uh, we're really hopeful that we can see the commission move to start incorporating um, these lessons in, into its practice, um, which really um, uh, we think uh, that the crux of that is, is going to be partnership with with local community and, and local groups, um, you know, particularly locally based um, uh, mobility justice groups um, that are that are rooted in in marginalized communities are the partners that um, are going to be necessary to really move uh, major agencies towards um, incorporating uh, um, restorative policies and, and policies rooted in equity. So um, we're hopeful that through the creation which we know is still in process of the Equity Advisory Committee and, and real uh, co-creation as Chanel terms it. Um, um, the CTC can move in that direction. So thanks very much for having this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, is there other? Okay. Yes, so Jim Davis, you are now unmuted. Hello, this is Jim Davis, Chief uh, Deputy Director of Caltrans. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Brown uh, for his presentation and also the CTC um, for having this topic. Um, like Commissioner Gardino, I'm a middle-aged white man and have a lot to learn in this. And uh, we look forward to Caltrans partnering with the CTC uh, in this space. I, I want to share a few things that we have been doing um, in, in this area because it's been brought up a, a number of times. First of all, uh, Secretary Tim has published a statement on race and equity and hopefully you'll see that or we can get that out to you because it's uh, uh, very important to show our commitment and he has tasked all the departments to commit to doing, doing better and taking action when it comes to equity. Another thing is uh, we've been working with the city of Oakland, especially Ryan Russo, and I think Mr. Brown brought him up, the director of the Oakland DOT, and we've actually had him come and talk to our executive team at Caltrans um, about all the great things that they're doing in the city of Oakland. Uh, also, if you, you didn't know, we actually have a, an equity action plan now, and it's on our website, and we can forward that 
the things that, that we're doing there. And we're starting to look at our, our workforce, and, and I believe the commissioner brought that up, and, and, and the number of African Americans that we have uh, in our ranks, uh, as well as looking at our programs and where we spend our money and our resources, as well as giving a hand up in growing business, small business, and disadvantaged business. These are areas that we're, we're actively working on and trying to do a lot better. And just uh, uh, one of the other things, we just had a meeting here uh, last week and one of our sessions on equity um, um, was incredible, a couple hour session talking about equity. And uh, we're adding a strategic goal in the middle of our strategic plan and, and adding a goal that's gonna focus in on equity and performance measures like Mr. Brown talked about. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share that and that we are fully uh, ready to partner and engage with the commission and the community to do better in, in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we appreciate hearing more about this when uh, Director Omashakin will be presenting his remarks today. Is there any other um, public comment in the queue? Yes, um, we have a few more. Let's see. Uh, Linda Kamushian, you are now unmuted. Thank you. Hi everyone, Linda Kamushian, uh, speaking on behalf of myself, a member of the public uh, in this moment. I just wanted to thank uh, the commission and, and Mr. Brown for his presentation uh, today. I think it gave a really uh, informative framework for what types of discussions we need to follow through with and, and actions to take. Uh, one of the things I'll mention that just from my uh, work uh, in this in this area is that the CTC has done listening sessions in the past uh, and specific to hearing from the community at the local level. And, and so I'm a little bit wary of what, what that would look like in this next iteration, if we can build upon that uh, and, and really identify key stakeholders, uh, uh, but then also the outcomes as was mentioned. But I did wanna just um, you know, really commend uh, that this, the commission for, for holding this session and, and really inquiring further. It's very obviously timely to understand how transportation uh, justice, transportation equity touches upon everyone's lives uh, and, and, and how much the transportation system that the CTC historically has uh, funded and created through its processes and decision-making has, has, has been complicit in the, in the process of uh, of racism, of 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 sending folks into situations that otherwise, uh, you know, they wouldn't necessarily be in, uh, given how they were traversing, and and again, the health implications uh, of how we build our communities and and transportation systems. So I I appreciate this conversation. I'm eager to hear how it goes forward, and I'm really interested to see how we can continue to have uh, public engagement in these uh, meetings, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have these conversations continue. Thanks. Thank you for your thoughtful remarks. Um, we have more public comment. Yes? Yes, we have uh, Julia Jordan. You are now unmuted. Hi, this is Julia Jordan. I'm with the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. And I just wanted to echo Chanel's comments about the need to commit to uh, a deep interrogation of current policies and practices and make sure that this is not a sort of a performative um, process just kind of happening in this moment in response to you know broader, I think, things going on in the world. Um, and I would add that there are a lot of organizations and community residents and advocates who've been bringing equity racial, and racial justice issues to the fore through comment letters, through public comment, like in these spaces, within private meetings, and through local organizing. And I would just suggest that everyone on this commission go back and look at some of those comments, look at how you know, previously there are specific suggestions about how equity can be enacted in practice. There are a lot of examples, I think, within you know, past iterations of, of these attempts. And I think you know, Linda also said the commission has done listening sessions in the past. So I think there's a lot to, to build on. And you know, this is in some ways a beginning, but in some ways it's not a beginning at all for many of us. And so I think also looking locally at a lot of the efforts, I think uh, Jonathan mentioned of local mobility justice groups, um, black, indigenous, and people of color led groups working on the ground and others committed to racial justice is really important. Um, and not just look at cities and counties, for example. I know the regions that we work in as a community-based organization, 
Uh, we often don't see eye to eye with local jurisdictions, but there's a wealth of knowledge out there among residents and among people with lived experience that is gonna be really crucial to making this uh, work. And then the last thing I wanna note is just that racial justice is an intersectional issue. So, uh, you know, consider the ways that the current uprisings around police brutality is very much connected to transportation and mobility. And there are overlapping issues of gender, of sexual orientation that all need to be identified within any kind of a framework of racial justice. Um, and this is all not something that's just a matter of kind of bad past decisions and sort of the history of CTC. It's something that's current. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the CTC is going to dive into this work and um, and 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 hopeful hopeful for the the uh, sort of the outcomes that will come from that. Thank you. We thank you for your optimism, and we look forward to working with you. Um, are there any other public comments? Yes. Yes, we have uh, one written comment from Jared Sanchez. I will be reading on his behalf. The CTC has previously held listening sessions around this topic. Can the summary be provided immediately? What reports have the CTC commissioned on transportation justice comments? Reports, letters, meetings, legislation they have seen, heard, and grappled with at least the past five years. And CTC's annual legislative reports the past several years have noted social equity work. What work has been done exactly? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to make sure because we only, is that, is that the last uh, written and is that the last public remark? I'd like to make sure before um, we lose the time with uh, Mr. Brown, we want to thank you, but we want to also give you uh, some more opportunity to talk to us about what you've heard and, and other advice you'd like to give us before you have to leave at 11. Yes, uh, again, thank you to the commission. Thank you to all the residents, the advocates who, who have chimed in. Um, I want to say that I wholeheartedly support every action, every suggestion and recommendation they have made. Um, I am in a very privileged position where I have been invited to speak directly to the commission on this topic. Um, I consider myself to be a street level researcher as well as a pracademic, having oh. done work both in practice as well as in the academy. But I grew up like many of the communities that we are now advocating for. I was reared in a town of 500 people to a single parent making less than $24,000 a year. I am currently at the height of my career having witness a great deal of success. I understand why it's important to advocate for these disenfranchised communities, many of which are low income, black and brown. Um, I do not want to leave out in this conversation because of my experiences, um, the low income white communities across California who are also burdened by these transportation decision makings. So while I appreciate being invited as an expert, the true experts reside in the communities throughout California of which you've heard from today. So it's an absolute honor to represent them. And I trust that they understand that I'm not speaking for them. I'm actually speaking with them in support of the many things that they've asked you for. Co-collaboration and creation is essential and these communities are the experts and they have the answers. And lastly, I would say uh, it behooves the commission and everyone when you do a listening session that you do report back to the community what you've heard and what you intend to do. We have no more time for just lip service. People are dying in the street each and every day, whether that's a result of a uh, traffic fatality or people being killed by law enforcement. The time is over for lip service. Either you're gonna become an anti-racist organization or you're gonna continue the status quo. Uh, thank you for having an opportunity to speak to you all and, and speak with the community. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Brown, and thank you for your life story and your success and the fact that you're using that success to uplift so many others and we take your advice to be productive and not performative very seriously. And we will be talking about that in the 
months and years to come with real action. Thank you for your time, and we really appreciate you giving us an hour when we know how very, very busy you are um, speaking nationwide on these topics. Awesome, and, and the last comment I'll make is, I don't want to be a tool that comes in, makes a presentation, and leaves. I've said all I've had to say because I really care about the residents of California and the future of California. Please reach out to me at any point in time to invite me back to engage with the commission as well as the residents because I'm, I'm best. I have a, an interest in ensuring that the community can um, ensure that what they're advocating for they are receiving because it is literally a matter of life and death. Thank you. And we will be reaching out to you and your care shows in everything you do in this conversation. Thank you so much for offering more of your time. Um, with that, right. I'd like thank to you. thank you. I'd like to uh, announce um, the report on motion item eight with Commission Executive Director Mitch Weiss. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank Charles Brown for that presentation and everybody uh, for that uh, really valuable discussion. You know, we've all in recent weeks witnessed the the racism and atrocities committed our country, and we're we're happy to confront the fact that white men carried assault rifles into another state's legislature with impunity, but a black man was killed for allegedly having a counterfeit twenty dollar bill. People across the street have, people across the country have taken to the streets demanding change. I believe we at the commission need to be a part of that change, and that item was a, a important step in that direction. Uh, with that, let me go into my report. I'd first like to welcome Commissioners Davis and Eager to the California Transportation Commission. I look forward to working with you in the years to come to help improve mobility across California. I would also like to welcome to the Commission staff Beverly Newman Burkhard. Before joining the Commission team, Beverly worked on healthcare policy and financing issues at the Department of Healthcare Services. Beverly is a bike commuter and races for a competitive women's cycling team in Sacramento. Uh, one logistical item I'd like to note, uh, when we are showing the agenda titles on the screen, we've added yellow highlight to indicate the items that were distributed uh, late last Friday, and then pink highlight to indicate late items that were distributed this week, and strike through to indicate items that have been withdrawn. I'll conclude my report by noting that in your materials is a proposed 2021 meeting schedule. I recommend approval of this schedule with authority delegated to staff to make changes as needed. I also recommend the scheduling of a meeting within the next two or three weeks for election of commission officers. Thank you very much, Director Weiss. Um, because the 2021 meeting schedule is an action item, I'd like to, I'd like to have a motion have for that motion action. For that action. Avalone moves it. Thank you. Thank you. There's a second. There's a second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Thank Burke. You. Um, uh, Douglas, would Douglas, you please read the roll? Read the roll. Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Dunn. Dunn. Yes. Commissioner Eager. Eager. Yes. Mr. Gardino. Mr. Gardino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Kehoe. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Mr. Tavaloni. Aye. Mr. Norton. Aye. Vice Chair, the motion is approved. Wonderful. And uh, with that, I'm going to call on myself for the commission report. And uh, first, I'd like to start off by welcoming our two new commissioners, Commissioner Eager from Fresno and Commissioner Davis from Rockland. We look forward to working with you into the time when we can all gather for more personal welcome. We also want to commend you that uh, Commissioners Davis and Eager were appointed only last Friday, and they have both taken their oath of office and are able to fully participate in this meeting. We thank you for your quick action in order to participate in today's meeting. Would you like to say a few words? I'll call on Commissioner Eager first. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, 
I think I uh, was able to meet most of you uh, last year up in Stevenson, Washington, when I came as a, a speaker to talk about the, the positive effects of transportation in the valley, uh, specifically high-speed rail, and was so impressed with all of the work that you all do on a regular basis. So when the, the governor asked me to, to step up and, and join this group, I was thrilled. So I'm looking forward to uh, meeting all of you again in person. Um, and to working on this uh, important issue going forward. Um, and I know uh, I'm from the Valley, and so uh, really looking at Valley issues, but I understand the importance of this for the entire state of California. So thank you all for welcoming me, and uh, I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, and welcome. Um, are there any statements from commissioners Sorry. about Commissioner Eager? Well, we all welcome you, and thank you for being here today. Um, Commissioner Davis, would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, I just want to uh, thank uh, staff and the rest of the board for the uh, the warm welcome, uh, hospitality, and all of the uh, very quick tutorial uh, that that we've been given to try to get ourselves in a position today where uh, we can participate. Uh, I look forward to working uh, with uh, on this commission and with the rest of the commissioners yeah. to uh, make sure that uh, we do all the things we can to uh, keep. Uh, California uh, moving and uh, and and uh, I'm from Southern California originally live in Sacramento area now uh, but uh, part of uh, my job requires me to run all over the state for my organization and uh, very very proud to be a, a native born Californian and think we need to do all we need to do to keep the state as great as we can and make all of the improvements that we need to make to make sure that this state is uh, uh, working for every citizen here uh, in this yeah. state and uh, look forward to uh, uh, the next several years working with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Is there anyone on any of our commissioners that like, would like to say something to Commissioner Davis? Well, we welcome on behalf of all of us. Um, and I'm delighted that we can have uh, Commissioner and former CTC Chair Paul Van Kenneinberg on the line. Um, we want to thank him for his service and, and he has asked to say a few words to all of us. So, uh, Commissioner von Kanenberg. Thank you, Vice Chair Norton, for the invitation to address the commission. Um, I just want to let you guys know, I owe a debt of gratitude to all Californians. It's been an honor to serve and represent you. I never forgot that we were spending your tax dollars, and I never forgot that the CTC exists to make transportation planning, funding, and policy more understandable and accountable to you. I owe a great gratitude to my family for enduring the inconvenience of my absence and travel while I was on the commission. Thank you to former Secretary Brian Kelly and Governor Brown for my appointment. Um, they selected a Central Valley farmer known for asking probative questions in the tradition of former Commissioner Kirk Lindsay, and they knew that the promises had been made to Californians with SB1, and they wanted to make sure those promises were kept. I also want to thank Assembly Members Frazier, Gray, Flora, and former Senator Canella for their support and encouragement. I really treasure the relationships that were made at my time on uh, the commission with our federal partners, Vince and Paul. Vince, I thought you were great as Hank Schrader on Breaking Bad. Uh, to Caltrans staff, the different district directors, uh, Dan McElhenney and Sherry Bender-Ellert. Uh, you really showed an example of how to partner and communicate with local agencies. Uh, to other district directors, John Beliski, Tim Grubbins, Emergy Benepal, and Tony Tavares, you were never afraid of a question and always willing to explain what you were doing in, uh, when a project came before the commission. At headquarters, I want to just um, show my appreciation to Stephen Keck and Bruce Tatera who were often um, had to come before the commission and, and do um, presentations that were difficult, and I, I appreciated how you handled yourself in those situations. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Jim Davis. Um, the CM CTC and commission, um, I'm, one of my goals as chair was to get the CTC and the, uh, and the uh, Caltrans to work better as a team. And we were working on having a no surprises relationship. And this is something Jim and I have been discussing over the past year. And at our last meeting, there were some frustrations and concerns over the discussion surrounding the fiscally balanced shop. And 
I was overheard making a hyperbolic statement to Mitch about my six foot six friend, Jim Davis. But because we have a relationship, I went down to his office after the meeting and we discussed our frustrations and concerns. We discussed how we could do it better in the future and how the two organizations can be on the same page. And I think that just once again states how important it is to have um, a, uh, a relationship with the people we work with. And so make an effort to make those relationships. I want to thank our local partners. And, and I think it's been stated before, transportation infrastructure projects in California are locally initiated. And, and have many hurdles to come to fruition. And I want to thank all of the local partners that I got to know. And thank you for the work, difficult work you do. Thank you for highlighting the underdeveloped corridors that still exist in California state's rural highways. I want to thank the self-help counties and, and all, the, all of those self-help counties that I got to know. Uh, thank you for the $5 billion that you bring to the table each year. And uh, the, each one has uh, a voter ex approved expenditure plan that's very diverse. No, no two plans are the same, and it was good to work with you. I want to highlight the, the NGOs that I got to work with, Esther at California Walks and Linda at California Bikes and Jonathan at Safe Rouse to School. When I came on the commission, one of my big um, initiatives was to have active transportation projects and complete streets projects in disadvantaged communities around California and especially in the legacy communities in the Central Valley. And I want to thank you for your work to help make the, that uh, a reality. For the CTC staff, I have never encountered such a professional and hardworking staff in government. Mitch Weiss, Susan Branson, Tanisha Taylor, Doug, Don, Garth, Laura, Lori, Teresa, Paul, and Terry, and everybody else. Um, not only are they great at their jobs, but they practice active listening to all sides of every issue to endeavor to make sure their policies and guidelines and decisions are fair and equitable to all. The, the presentation they, they put together, um, the presentation they put together that we just heard is a perfect example. The in, images and incidents of racial injustice over the past five weeks have less of, left us all heartbroken, devastated, grieving, gutted, angry, rage, frustration. We've had so many, so much energy and emotions, and our staff's response is how can we convert this energy and emotions into action? How can we convert this energy and these emotions into building something better? How can we convert this energy and these emotions into trying some new things in a new direction? And I applaud them for that. To our new, welcome to the new commissioners, Davis and Eager. Congratulations on your appointment. Uh, Commissioner Liu, I am deeply sad that we never got to physically be in a meeting together. But I will tell you that I, every time you asked a, a, a question based on something that was 600 pages deep into the agenda, my heart sang a little bit because I knew that you had spent time reading the full thousand page agenda and I love that. And then finally, Commissioners Alvarado, Butler, Burke, Dunn, Arp, Gelmetti, Gardino, Inman, Kehoe, Medaffer, Norton, and Tavaloni. You know how much I love you. I, uh, I, I so enjoyed working with you, and thank you for being my friend. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And uh, we have some people who'd like to, to say their thanks, and I hope you stay on for the um, reports from uh, CalSTA and Caltrans, because I believe they wanted to incorporate you in their remarks as well. Um, Commissioner Gardino. Thank you, Vice Chair Norton. Uh, Paul, what an honor it's been to work with someone as indefatigable, passionate, caring, candid, yet always kind uh, as you. Uh, it's been an honor to get to know you and your family, your graciousness, uh, is your trademark, uh, and uh, with heartfelt thanks, uh, thank you for your service, leadership, and partnership on the commission, and I know well beyond your days and my days on this body. Thank you again. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Alvarado. I just want to say, Paul, thank you very much for all your service, and um, you know, when, when they told me that we have a uh, um, a clone of my friend, Kirk Lindsay, 
you know, those were big shoes to fill. Uh, you did an excellent job, and I think Kirk would be proud of you. So I wish you well, my friend. Thank you. Bob. And uh, for my part, Paul, I just wanted to say that um, it has been a privilege learning from you, and I think your perspectives about freight and rural communities and how we need to take account of the entire state and being a voice for the agricultural community, we are going to be calling on you. And we just want you to know that we are so delighted at, and the state is a better place for your service. Um, with that, uh, I wanna call on Commissioner Inman as well. I just wanna lean in and uh, thank you, Paul, and tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity I've had to work with you, to learn from you, and look forward to working with you as uh, Vice Chair Norton talked about uh, uh, as we move forward together. So um, all the best and thank you to your service to all the people of the state of California. Thank you. Uh, we have some public comment on your item as well. Yes, we have one written comment from Joe Borgia. We would like to thank Commissioner Van Kenneberg on his leadership and willingness to listen to stakeholders from all walks of life, his close attentiveness, attentiveness to all transportation issues, and his close desire to reading the book items are well received by staff and stakeholders alike. We know that you will continue to do what's best for California and to the community statewide. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I believe Commissioner Burke also wanted to speak. Uh, yes, I just want to say to you, Paul, it's been my pleasure to get to know you and your family. And you represented your area so well. And it's difficult to communicate to some of us city dwellers how important agriculture community is. So I want to say we will miss you. And yes, don't forget us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Kehoe. Will you be Thank you. Um, all the same, I want to join my fellow commissioners in congratulating you for the fine job you did uh, all your time on the commission, but especially as chair. I really appreciated your uh, organization and timeliness and uh, efficiency without ever cutting corners. So I, uh, I really respect your, your prudent nature and guidance and uh, uh, it was a pleasure working with you, and I wish you well in all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And again, I, I'd like you to stick around for the other um, reports that are coming up, because I believe they'll be talking about you as well. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Um, in conclusion of my report, I just want to thank uh, Director Mitch Weiss and Deputy Directors Garth Hopkins and Tanisha Taylor for leaning in on the issues of racial inequities and um, our listening sessions. These are intended to be productive and not performative. And our goal is to outline this vision today, but to have this be in deep partnership with all of those who spoke today and more around the state who seek to be part of the equity advisory committee and guide our discussions. And while I hear and, and, and appreciate that there were listening sessions before, I will say that that was a different commission. It was under different commission staff and different commission leadership. And I think we all know that we're a different state today and a different governor, a different head of uh, Caltrans and a different secretary of transportation. And so I am very confident about where we are going to go if we act together in, um, humility and partnership and ambition about what this new day will bring. And with that, um, I'd like to end my remarks. And because we have one item where um, our speaker has a conflict at 1130, I'd like to move to item 16 for a second. And that is to call on. Uh, OK, sure. I'm sorry. Um, Director Weiss just asked if there were reports from the other commissioners. Okay, if not, um, we would like to go to item 16, the transit operators update and 
call on Carl Sudork. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you. My name is Carl Sidorek, and I am the CEO for the Monterey Salinas Transit District. And I appreciate you uh, taking my agenda item. Uh, I have a 92-year-old mother that uh, I take care of. And uh, during these times, <laughs> like everything else, it's a little, little difficult. Um, so uh, trying to get the, the whole video conference, uh, medical appointments and all that. Um, so. With that, uh, I was asked to provide an update uh, on how a small rural public transit operator is responding to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, again, I'm the CEO for Monterey Salinas Transit, and I'll tell you a little bit about, I'm telling you this was past uh, uh, six months ago, uh, I was worried about things like how was I ever going to be able to put in infrastructure for zero emission buses and, and get those buses to travel the range as I need them and how am I going to respond to calls for free transportation for college students and for elderly and for uh, a number of other constituencies and then all of a sudden the world changed. So next slide please. As the famous statesman uh, Yogi Berra or the New York Yankees said, the future ain't what it used to be. And uh, we are sure living that. So next slide, please. Uh, first, a little description about uh, the Monterey Salinas Transit and our service area. We serve a broad swath of the central coast of California from uh, serving San Luis Obispo County, Monterey County, parts of Santa Cruz County, and into Santa Clara County, as far north as San Jose. Um, our county is, uh, 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 has for a, a economic drivers uh, the four billion dollar a year ag agricultural community, um, three billion dollars a year hotel hospitality industry, and a one billion dollar uh, educational uh, uh, California State University's community colleges and Department of Defense training institutes. Monterey uh, Salinas Transit is still one of the few transit operators. Not uncommon in rural areas. We do not have a local sales tax that supports our regular fixed route operations. So we're dependent on passenger fares, state and federal sources. We do have a small local sales tax that supports our ADA paratransit services. Next slide. So when um, the pandemic hit, uh, MST in April, uh, had uh, Monterey County, you can see, has a over 20% unemployment rate in April. It has gotten a little bit better slightly for uh, May, but um, that was at the time the second highest unemployment rate uh, by county in the, uh, in the uh, state, as far as I know. Uh, total occupancy stats, taxes from hotels, a major economic driver in our county, uh, declined 24% uh, for the fiscal year ending uh, June 30th and projected to be down 74% for the fiscal year ending 2021. You can see the layoff notices in Monterey County that have been uh, uh, through June 1st, 2020, what's been uh, going on there. So all of this, uh, uh, our, our partnerships with our colleges that have helped fund our services, the colleges have gone to online learning, so no need for our services taking the students, faculty, and staff to school. Hospitality workers have been furloughed, laid off, are waiting to go back to work. Um, that's affected us immensely. Um, people not going to work. So next slide. Uh, this is a, uh, you can see what happened to our passengers uh, right after the shelter in place went into effect. We went down to about an 85% drop in total passengers, and that has been slowly clawing its way back. Um, and by the end of this week, I think we'll see the highest ridership since the shelter in place went into effect. Uh, but you can see a deep decline in uh, passengers, which during this time we suspended collecting fares, um, encouraged our passengers to board through the rear door to encourage social distancing between the driver and the passengers. Next slide. So uh, here we said, well, would you please elaborate on then something bad happened. Uh, this was, uh, could have been taken at one of our finance committee meetings with our board. Next slide. 
Uh, you can see where we were projecting for our fiscal year 2020 revenue of $53 million. Next slide. For fiscal year 2021, we see about an, we're anticipating about a $12 million uh, drop in our traditional sources of funding. So um, we needed to figure out what to do about that. There is a silver lining here. Uh, next slide. That's called the CARES Act. Uh, transit operators were uh, around the country were eligible to receive the uh, uh, CARES Act funding from the federal government. Unlike uh, many small jurisdictions and small rural areas, jurisdictions under 500,000 uh, did not were not able to participate. Uh, our funding from the CARES Act should be able to carry us. Uh, we are backfilling uh, this year. Um, we're going to be carried through next year and even if we may, uh, depending on uh, how quickly the economy returns, we may be able to carry some of those funds forward into fiscal year 22. Um, so that's good news um, from the transit side that the CARES Act funding um, has been helping us out. It really though is dependent on how well the state uh, sales tax and local sales taxes uh, uh, come back for us. Next slide. So, uh, you know, what was our immediate response? Um, you know, we did have a, a, a pandemic uh, response plan. Uh, we had a, a emergency plan that contemplates, you know, fires, floods, uh, civil uh, disturbances and pandemics. So we did have a plan and we initiated that even before the governor initiated the state of emergency. We were watching what was going on and we started putting our plan together. Um, the enhanced cleaning that you've seen going around with antiviral uh, types of, of, of uh, uh, solvents. We were already doing that due to a Hep A outbreak that occurred along coastal California about five years ago. We started practices including uh, cleaning our buses with these uh, materials and our facilities, and we just never stopped. We just thought it was a good practice. So we already had the, uh, pers the PPE equipment, masks, gloves, hazmat suits. We had already put that in place, so we were fortunate because when the demand from around the country hit the supply chain, we were already well suited and were able to ride that storm out. Uh, as I had mentioned, we suspended fare collection. We uh, put some fogging equipment uh, for our buses and facilities, uh, enhanced our cleaning regimens. Um, we even procured uh, almost a half a million dollars of barriers that will be put into place are in the process of going into place that uh, will put a physical barrier between the driver and the passengers as they board. Uh, as I said, those are ongoing, ongoing now. We reduced our service levels by 40% when we saw that big drop in ridership. And uh, basically it was a Sunday schedule that we modified to include uh, in increased services to local medical facilities and hospitals. Um, and suspended some services to the colleges and the military training institutes because they were closed. Uh, we implemented face mask requirements for all of our employees and our passengers even before the county health officer made the order for uh, Monterey County. We were already pushing that forward as a best practice. And we've promoted social distancing, essential travel, and personal hygiene uh, throughout. I have some samples of those on the next slides. Next slide. Um, you can see the social distancing on board our buses with the masks. Those are our passengers on board our buses, our drivers. We put hand sanitizers on board every one of our 163 buses, and we have uh, uh, adequate hand sanitize, sanitation going on there. Next slide. Um, we put markers at, outside uh, telling people where to wait uh, six feet apart. You see that common in, in indoor grocery stores, we did that in an exterior. Uh, we even got uh, a little snarky about it uh, early on, um, as far as was this an essential trip? If yes, okay to ride. If no, if you can read that sign to the right, why are you even here reading this? Go home. Uh, that was the message we were sending out early on uh, before the economy started to open back up. Next slide. Uh, we used uh, advertising revenue, uh, you know, as businesses, uh, uh, we're, we're seeing economic impacts. A lot of folks cut back on advertising, so we had unsold ad space. We use that unsold ad space to print signs in English and Spanish uh, to maintain social distance, save lives, wash your hands, all that good stuff. Next slide. So we also um, 
we didn't have the passengers riding the buses. We had CARES Act money that was allowing us not to furlough our passengers, but we needed to keep them active and involved um, in supporting our community. So we pivoted. Uh, we used our drivers and vehicles to, look, to deliver over 8,000 meals uh, throughout the communities of the Salinas Valley. We took our Wi-Fi enabled buses and uh, actually need to update this number. We visited rural and underserved communities lacking in Wi-Fi and we provided up 6,000 individual internet connections uh, to these communities so they could uh, these folks without internet connections at home could download their remote learning. We've delivered masks to high-risk communities in our farm worker communities, uh, East Salinas, Castroville, and in the South County cities along the Highway 101. Uh, we took some of our staff uh, that deal with elderly, disabled, and veteran communities, and uh, we have them doing tele-wellness check-ins, um, just checking in, talking to them, um, helping to identify their needs, and just providing a, a voice. Uh, we are in the process of working towards implementation of a contactless fare collection technology system um, that which will go into place September 14th again to uh, uh, help mitigate and prevent future uh, outbreaks. And we're meeting regularly with our county health officer to receive guidance on as the community comes back and workers need to use our services, how can we um, uh, get as many people safely on our buses as we possibly can and what uh, uh, what things can we do like keeping our windows open and blowers running all the time we've discovered that we can clear the air 100 percent air exchange in under two minutes on our buses health officers like that next slide um working with the california uh state association to work on uh, various activities to um, uh, basically hold us all harmless on a variety of transit funding efficiency measures. Uh, these items, AB 90, uh, it's a budget measure bill that uh, will go in after the governor signs the budget, uh, hopefully later this week, will help transit operators um, not be penalized uh, within some of the formulas that fund us. Next slide. And we're looking, we're using the FEMA whole community recovery evaluation criteria to bring our systems back. We are surveying using um, Slido and other online survey tools in English and in Spanish, community leaders, uh, people who don't ride the bus, people who do ride the bus. We're pushing out the survey through our transit app. So people who have been using our app are getting surveys and our own employees. And we're looking at um, the various needs and rate, rate various projects on a scale using a, a criteria developed by FEMA that's been proven to help communities recover faster. Next slide. Here's an example of what the output looks like. Um, so we're looking at a variety of projects here, whether it's increasing frequency, our Monterey Trolley, Presidio of Monterey Military Services, or our South County facilities. And we're, you know, we're so we're examining how well those help total community recovery. Next slide. So we are continuing our surveys. We're continuing to monitor the activities of our major employees as, as opening occurs faster and faster. July 11th, we're going to restore a, a lot more service back to the community. Uh, the aquarium is opening and back up on July 13th. So as it, our guess was pretty good about, uh, we set this date July 11th, not knowing when the aquarium was going to open. A lot of the businesses in Monterey that generate a lot of our trips for the, the hospitality workers were waiting to see what the aquarium was going to do. Um, we are working on the contactless fare collection system and we're working on a final plan and we'll continue to implement and monitor the plan as we move through this crisis. Uh, that should complete my uh, presentation. Next slide. Um, you know, people ask me what this is like. It's like trying to rebuild the plane while trying to fly it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, and try not to be the guy over there by the beverage cart too much. Sometimes it <laughs> happens. Now. All right. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we know that you have some time constraints, but I just wanted to um, open this up for any questions yeah, from I've got the about commissioners. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions from our commissioners? Okay. Are there any questions from the public or input from the public on this? Okay. Well, thank you. This is a very thorough presentation, and we'll be following up with you um, outside of the meeting on some of the really great items that you presented in your, your PowerPoint today. 
Thank, Thank you. you I appreciate time. it. I hope you found it informative. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And with that, we'd like to move to item 10, um, the presentation from CalSTA Secretary David Kim. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission, as well as Commission staff and the public. Uh, let me start with a real-time update. I uh, don't know if you felt it, but at 1040 this morning, there was an earthquake in Tulare County, Lone Pine to be exact, uh, just east of Sequoia National Park, and very close to the Ridgecrest earthquake that happened almost a year ago. Um, this earthquake registered 6.1. Uh, Caltrans and CHP are currently uh, assessing damage. So far, no damage to state facilities, as far as we can tell. Obviously, it's early in the uh, inspection process, so we'll have more uh, to say about it later on. But just wanted to point that out in case some of you felt some sl slight swaying, depending on your location. Um, let me start out by uh, recognizing several individuals who have reached significant milestones. First. Huge congratulations to Caltrans Director Tokes Omushakin, who was confirmed by the Senate just two weeks ago by a vote of 39 to nothing. Uh, truly exciting news for all of us, and we're thrilled he is fully confirmed. Um, also want to congratulate Commissioner Norton. Madam Chair, you did an impressive job in your commission, in your confirmation hearing before the Senate Rules Committee less than 24 hours ago. Uh, the unanimous vote by the committee says a lot about you and your extensive background, and I am confident the Senate will confirm your nomination in the very near future. Also, I'd like to add my welcome and congratulations to our two brand new commissioners, Leanne Eager and Rocco Davis. The fact that both of you are not wasting any time diving into the work of the commission is impressive. So congratulations, welcome, and I, and I look forward to getting to know you. Finally, as others have done, I want to express my sincere, my sincere appreciation to Commissioner Paul Van Kynenberg. Paul really dedicated himself to the work of this commission. Um, my observation of him is that he developed an in-depth understanding of the many programs and policies of the CTC, and he always came to these meetings exceedingly well prepared. So I want to thank Paul for his dedicated service and wish him and his family all the best in the years ahead. I'd like to now briefly address the subject that was presented by Professor Brown uh, recent developments that have raised our collective consciousness around issues of systemic racism, injustice, and social equity. I thought it was a great presentation, a lot of food for thought, and I think his recommendations will help us as we move forward. I released a statement a couple weeks ago on racial equity, justice, and inclusion in transportation, and one of the things we say in that statement is that CalSTA strongly condemns systemic racism and discrimination in all forms, including those historically entrenched in transportation. We also point out that transportation decisions of the past literally put up barriers, divided communities, and amplified racial inequalities, especially in our black and brown neighborhoods. I very much believe that racial equity, inclusion, and diversity are foundational to achieving our vision of a cleaner, safer, more accessible, and more connected transportation future for California. And so going forward, CalSTA and our departments will be part of the solution. We're going to promote policies and programs that reflect principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're going to work with stakeholders to identify areas of improvement. So I hope you'll take a moment to read our statement, which is on CalSTA's website. And I also greatly welcome your input as we take steps to ensure that transportation systems are designed and delivered in a manner that will provide safe and equitable access to opportunity particularly for people of color and disadvantaged communities to truly enhance quality of life because in the end, that's what we're all about. And I also want to say we are very mindful of the fact that statements like this are only as good as the actions we take and the results we achieve in advancing the cause of justice. And that's exactly what we tend to do to back up our words with actions. The governor asked all of us in the cabinet to be bold in our word, in word and deed, and that's what we're going to do. Let me turn to a transit for a moment, and I really appreciate the presentation we just heard from Monterey Salinas Transit. Uh, we're all fully aware that transit agencies are facing massive challenges as a result of the global pandemic. But I personally see tremendous cooperation and coordination in the industry at both the statewide and regional level. 
Uh, I think this crisis is really focusing us on what's most important. And I think it's more vital than ever to address these challenges with creativity and flexibility so that the very real needs of those who are traveling are addressed. And thankfully, this kind of a concerted effort is now underway in the Bay Area, thanks to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. MTC recently formed a Blue Ribbon Task Force that I serve on with a group of civic leaders and elected officials, including Senator Bell, Assemblymember Chu, and our very own Commissioner Carl Guardino. I believe Monterey Salinas Transit may also be on the task force. The region is asking very important questions, such as how do we rebuild and reimagine transit as we begin to restore transit service to meet the needs of future riders? It's a critically important initiative, and I look forward to contributing to and learning from the task force to ensure that transit agencies not just survive, but thrive. I also want to take a moment to recognize the commission's action at the last meeting to approve the initial $42 million investment for a complete streets reservation to fund bike and pedestrian infrastructure in the shop program. These funds will play an important role in improving safety and access for people who walk and bike. And these are exactly the kinds of investments that will promote public health, produce cleaner air, and help reduce our dependence on driving, which we all know is essential for the state to meet its long-term climate goals. It's also worth hi highlighting the fact that these funds are particularly important for communities, especially communities of color, that have historically been harmed by transportation decisions of the past. And so I wanna thank Caltrans for their hard work to meet their commitment they made to the governor last fall to increase investments in active transportation within the shop. And I look forward to the commission's approval during today's meeting for an additional 58 million for complete streets, which would result in a 100 million shop investment. And I wanna emphasize that Caltrans will continue to make active tra transportation considerations a standard practice in the shop program. So these investments are just the beginning. Finally, I'd like to briefly touch on congressional efforts to reauthorize the surface transportation program. Last week, the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee marked up and approved the Invest in America Act this is a comprehensive reauthorization proposal that will replace the FAST, and FAST Act, which expires this fall. It authorizes $494 billion over five years to make transformative investments in surface and rail transportation. And according to our calculations, over the next five years, California is slated to receive approximately $26.5 billion in federal aid highway apportionments. That's a 30%, 37% increase over the current authorization. What I'm really excited about is the fact that the Invest in America Act closely aligns with many of our policy recommendations outlined in our surface transportation reauthorization principles that were endorsed by the commission, as well as over 30 organizations and industry associations. Several months ago, in fact, just before the pandemic, Director Omashak and Commissioner Van Kanenberg and I were in Washington to meet with the chairman of the House T&I Committee, Peter DeFazio of Oregon, as well as members of the California delegation to, to discuss a handful of high priority items. And I'm happy to say that all of these items have been included in the House bill. And I'll just mention one of them really quickly. The committee included a provision that will allow electric vehicle charging infrastructure to be installed at interstate rest areas and park and ride facilities. This type of activity, as you may know, has long been prohibited by federal law. Uh, but if this provision makes it into law, we'll be able to expand the state's EV charging infrastructure in a substantial way. Uh, there are many more highlights of the bill that I'd be happy to talk about um, uh, offline with commissioners and others, but the bottom line is that the Invest in America Act will help California address and advance many of our transportation priorities. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you for the time, and I look forward to today's meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Secretary Kim, and congratulations on your rousing success in DC and making sure that California's needs are reflected in federal legislation. I wanted to ask if any of our other commissioners would like to address Secretary Kim and ask questions or make comments on his report. Okay, thank you very much, Secretary Kim, and uh, thank you so much for your work. And we look forward to working with you on our um, listening sessions and our efforts to uh, make sure we're making inroads and real progress on equity issues as you have laid out in your own statement with your own department. Thank you so much. With that, we would like to move to the report number 11 from Caltrans Director Cox Omashakin.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, good. That's great. Uh, a very, uh, very good morning to to the commission and uh, all me members of the pub public also listening in to uh, listening in to the meeting today. If I could, I want to. If I can, I want to start off with uh, thanking several people and congratulating several people before I get into my um, into my remarks. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, want to congratulate you as was mentioned earlier on your confirmation at, at the Senate yesterday. Uh, congratulations on uh, being uh, confirmed and also serving as an acting chair and hopefully uh, our chair uh, moving forward uh, ultimately as well. I want to congratulate uh, our OIG, our Inspector General, uh, Rhonda Kraft, who was also confirmed um, yesterday by, um, by the Body Senate Rules Committee uh, as well. And congratulations to uh, to John uh, Rocco and to Leon Eager, our, our new commissioners. Uh, congratulations, commissioners, on, on your appointment. And I look forward to uh, to working with you and serving with you um, in the efforts uh, in, our, in our transportation efforts uh, moving forward. And also want to uh, to recognize uh, uh, Commissioner PVK um, as he um, uh, rounds up his service on the commission. Thank him for. Uh, his service to, to the commission and the people of the state. And as Secretary Kim mentioned, uh, we, we had a, a very good trip uh, to Washington earlier this year where we met with our uh, Washington delegation. And I, I think that meeting yielded uh, many positive, uh, many positive outcomes for us as a state. So now to uh, some of some of my, uh, my, my remarks, I want to, Say so again, you know, in, in the middle of what's a, a tremendously difficult time for all of us, we are working through a health, uh, global health pandemic, and we've been hit with societal injustice and equity issues over the last several months. We still somehow have been able to muster through all of the challenges that we've been facing. Uh, when you consider since the, the last meeting, uh, the amount of work that's been going on, it's to the tune of roughly $3 billion uh, amount of transportation related work um, and uh, nearly 30,000 jobs uh, related uh, related impacts as well. So more than $3 billion roughly and, and 30,000 jobs uh, in, in related impacts. So kudos to our local partners uh, our, our federal partners and, and of course our state partners in the efforts to to continue to move the ball forward uh, for, for transportation uh, in the state. And so as we work through uh, a global this the, 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 the challenges that we face, uh, a lot of good work is still happening and a lot of good work um, has been happening uh, obviously prior. I, I will as long as I'm granted the opportunity, we'll continue to highlight uh, key staff within the department that are doing great work. And one of them that, uh, that I will highlight today is um, Bob Adams, who is a governmental program analyst and small business liaison working out of our Stockton uh, district office in District 10. And uh, one of the things that Bob has been able to do for us, uh, as you see his, uh, his image there, this picture there, is he's been working on ongoing issues to solve small business contracting uh, challenges that we've had. Uh, one of the things we he was able to notice that was that uh, small businesses are were unfamiliar with the certification and bidding process, and they would occasionally not complete the steps required to su submit a successful bid. Bob and his team uh, set out to increase participation by DBEs by developing an effective education program uh, targeting small businesses. Bob designed a user-friendly boot camp on the bidding process from beginning to end and helped to provide, uh, provide hands-on training to attendees. Uh, currently, prime contractors shared helpful strategies with, with the DBEs on how to become, how to become primes. 
Bob included industry experts and partners from the Federal Highways Administration and local government councils to answer questions and provide additional information. Because of Bob's efforts, um, he and his team's efforts, 140 new small businesses interested in participating in subcontracting opportunities were added to the outreach database. Uh, strategic partnerships were established with non-governmental organizations such as nonprofit trade organizations uh, and the private industry. Uh, numerous firms that attended the boot camp continue to bid on Caltrans projects today. Uh, Bob's commitment to innovation will help DBEs navigate the certification process and help to develop our partnership with industry contractors. So I want to thank uh, Bob Adams in District 10 for his innovative approach to helping small businesses um, across the state. So kudos to, to, to Bob and his team and to Dan Malpahaney, our District 10 director for all the work they're doing in this space. Uh, that work becomes uh, even more glaringly important uh, in times like this when uh, we are facing uh, difficulties and challenges on, on many fronts. So thanks, Bob. Uh, so, uh, with me serving uh, in this role over the last uh, nine months or so, roughly, uh, there's there's continued to be significant change um, in the leadership uh, structure of Caltrans. Uh, uh, continue to make new hires. It seems like uh, almost uh, almost on a weekly basis, and I have eight to recognize here. I don't want to go through in detail all of their background, but I will quickly. Uh, try to briefly mention their name and 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 a little bit of their background as they step into uh, some have been reappointed into roles and some people some of these individuals are, are new to these to these responsibilities uh, first of all i want to uh, congratulate uh, aaron ochoko who uh, i appointed on may 18th to serve as deputy director of caltrans uh, for administration uh, he was uh, uh, his role becomes effective May 18th of 2020. Uh, Aaron began his career at the at the DMV. Uh, he has worked at uh, District 11 um, in, in several uh, roles. Uh, in 2013, Aaron uh, be, uh, completed an acting assignment as Administrative Branch Supervisor uh, for the Headquarters Division of Maintenance. And he most recently served as Division Chief of Safety and Management Services uh, so congratulations, Aaron, again, for stepping into this critical role for the department. I want to thank Aaron Holbrook for her dedication and focus and drive and leading that, that program area before um, as the acting deputy director of administration uh, during what was an incredibly challenging time for, for us in the department. Uh, but I also want to congratulate Aaron um, as she has been appointed our chief counsel at, at Caltrans. Uh, effective May 15th. The governor uh, uh, signed off on this uh, appointment. Uh, Aaron has been ch uh, assistant chief counsel of the department since uh, 2017 and has had several positions in the department since 2010. Uh, as well as Aaron's appointment by the governor, there are three other executives that have also been reappointed by the governor effective May 15th. Uh, Tammy McGowan has been reappointed Assistant Director of Public Affairs. Uh, she served in that role since 2007. Prior to that, she held several positions at Caltrans from 1992 to, two, to 2007. Ellen Greenberg has been reappointed Deputy Director for Sustainability. Where she served in that position since 2016. Uh, prior to that, Ellen was Director of Ove AROP. Uh, and partners uh, from 2014 to 2016. Um, and finally, the governor uh, also reappointed Danny Yost as uh, assistant director for legislation where he has served in that position since 2018. Uh, he was prior legislative liaison from 2012 to 2018. A few additional appointments uh, have had the opportunity to, to, uh, to make. Uh, Diana Gomez is now district six director uh, for the past seven years, Diana Gomez has been a member of the executive team at the California High Speed Rail. Uh, prior to her appointment at the High Speed Rail, Diana spent 25 years uh, with Caltrans, where she served as senior transportation electrical engineer 
and Chief of the Office of Traffic Management and Systems Management Operations. So congratulations, uh, Diane, Diana, um, as, as she takes on this new assignment leading District 6. Also want to congratulate Sherry, Sherry Bender, who many of you know. Uh, want to congratulate her and thank her for her, her many years of service uh, working in the department and leading District 6 uh, prior. Uh, also, uh, have filled recently filled the District 11 uh, director position. I have appointed Gustavo Delada uh, as District 11 uh, director. Uh, Gustavo has a civil service career that spans nearly three decades uh, in, in multiple uh, areas uh, and in del delivering multimodal projects uh, for, the, for the district. Uh, he prior served as chief deputy uh, district director for two years uh, with executive level responsibility in operations uh, and maintenance. Uh, Gustavo also worked as the corridor director for the I-15 and I-805 corridors uh, in San Diego. And finally, uh, as far as appointments, I want to uh, congratulate uh, uh, someone who you know very well also who has been a part of many CTC meetings. Uh, have filled the headquarters division of project management position. Um, uh, we have appointed Donna Berry as the new division chief of project management. Uh, for the past five years, Donna has worked as the office chief for the shop program and the division of transportation programming. There she played an integral role in transforming and shifting the paradigm on assets management uh, uh, for the department. So thank you uh, to Donna uh, uh, and congratulations as she steps uh, into this new role. As you can see, a lot of changes here at Caltrans. I congratulate everyone on their appointments and I'm looking forward to working uh, with all these individuals uh, on the Caltrans team. Now, just a few more uh, quick points on some of the items that have been touched on already um, uh, this morning. Uh, as far as COVID is related, just one quick note uh, on on COVID. Uh, Governor Newsom on June 15th signed N16-20, uh, a new executive order that does a, that does a lot of good work uh, for our, our state to help us continue to help us through the pandemic. Uh, but more specifically in the area of transportation, it, it extends the permissions for commercially licensed food trucks to operate in roadside rest areas. Uh, in compliance with a temporary permit issued by us at Caltrans to ensure essential infrastructure workers have access to food. So thank you to the governor um, as he signed this new executive order that provides us this extension. So uh, very, very briefly, if I can, I, I wanna touch on uh, the issues of, of complete streets, um, uh, safety, um, and uh, and equity, and I'll and I'll start off with um, equity very very quickly. I, I want to thank uh, Governor Newsom uh, for his uh, just unrelenting leadership on on this issue. Um, he's been uh, uh, about these issues even before the recent incidents that have highlighted this uh, globally. His mantra of a California for all is something that I, I think we are all. Uh, bought into, but we have to uh, we have to to uh, continue to to take significant action on. I also want to thank Secretary Kim uh, for setting the stage for us um, as the as the transportation entities. Um, his bold uh, statement uh, that that recently came out is exactly what we need. Um, and again, as you heard from him. Uh, we have to get beyond, uh, you know, great statements. And I think he, he has said that clearly himself. We need to be taking um, action uh, in this space. And also want to thank uh, the CTC, um, uh, all the commissioners and the staff um, and uh, for, for their efforts as well. This, the conversation that was held early on today, uh, the guest speaker, uh, th those are the kind of steps that we need to we, we need to take. Um, the listening uh, sessions that are being proposed, uh, I, I look forward to Caltrans being a part of that. Uh, we have discussed the similar steps within the department. 
and I, um, I, I look forward to uh, working with uh, the, the commission and members of the community, of, as was stated before, as uh, steps like that, as we try to move forward on steps like that. Um, I, I will say uh, that we have to get beyond equity as a talking point, um, but instead a living point. Uh, we have to live through uh, a, a lens of equity um, and not just talk about equity. And so th that's the challenge before us. Before us. And so uh, I, I want to ask us to, to think about living through this and not just talking about it. Um, some of the items that were laid out uh, before as recommendations uh, for us uh, by, our, by our speaker, um, three or four of those items we are already doing at Caltrans. Uh, Jim Davis mentioned this um, earlier. We have an action plan. Uh, we have an internal equity group, and maybe not defined exactly as such, but a team working on equity issues. Um, uh, the the statement on equity that uh, Secretary Kim uh, uh, put out, I think, is one that shows uh, where our values are. Uh, it, it may not necessarily be an anti-racist statement, as was described, but very much a pro-equity statement. So um, uh, uh, that's another step that, that is really uh, important as we look to move forward. And I recently sent out a message to staff that was a call to commitment on issues uh, of equity. So we're doing a lot in this space, but more concrete action will ultimately be demanded of us, uh, will be requested of us. And so I look forward to um, look forward to us being able to, to take those steps. Um, I, I will be completely remiss, completely, uh, if I didn't mention the obvious fact that I know uh, that in the 100 year history, plus year history of this department, I am the first uh, African-American to serve in this role. But there are many people who have come before me who were uh, 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 what you would consider minorities in serving in, this, in, in, in key roles in this department. Uh, there have only been three women to lead this organization. Uh, there are people uh, uh, like uh, uh, Comey, uh, I, as you said, there are people like Tony Harris uh, who have come before me um, and I, I sort of walk in their shoes um, in this in this role. Um, but I'm here to serve uh, the people of the state, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of income. But as long as I'm in this role, uh, if we cannot make major strides, if we cannot make major strides on equity issues, it will be all for nothing. Uh, despite the fact that I, I am here to, to help ensure that we as a department, we as a state move forward in transportation across the board. There are equity challenges that we obviously have. And uh, I, I'm hoping that we can, uh, we can take the steps that we need to, to define, listen, uh, take action and measure our, our growth um, in, in this particular space. Uh, so that is mainly it on equity. And I'll say quickly on safety and, and, and complete streets. Uh, uh, we have a uh, com complete streets and safety have always been a, a thing of focus for Caltrans. Uh, but what I am hoping that we can do, our leadership team and at every, every level of department can do is double down on, on these issues as priorities. Uh, and, and why? 3,600 people a year die in the state uh, from uh, traffic-related crashes. Um, as you heard in the presentation earlier, we're the 16th most dangerous state uh, for people who are walking and biking. Uh, two to three people die every single day walking or biking in our state. Uh, there are more than 14,000 serious crashes um, in this state every year. Um, those are things that have to change. Uh, we've hired a, a chief safety officer to help guide us through this process. Our traffic and safety team are, are doubling down on their focus on traffic, traffic safety. And we're gonna continue to work with the CHP and OTS um, and the, uh, the CALSA leadership team on, on making advancements and improvements uh, on the safety front. And finally, on complete streets, uh, um, you know, I wanna thank 
the commission for the approval of the $42 million in the last meeting. And uh, hopefully at the end of this meeting, we will finalize the 58 million for uh, the total of a hundred million dollar investment as, as has been stated multiple times already. The hundred million dollar uh, commitment is just a, a commitment to, to sort of um, fix uh, things midstream, if you will. Uh, but this is not about fixing things midstream, the complete streets and our outlook on modality. Uh, it, it, this has to be a standard, um, as was stated earlier, standard way we do business. Mm -hmm. And I, I look forward to our growth in this area. We're taking many steps. Uh, we've, uh, we're laying out an action plan and, and working with stakeholders in, in partnership to lay out that action plan. And I, I know we are going to make uh, significant strides in this in this place. We're doing them already. We have a lot of more uh, work to do, uh, but I, I know how important and critical uh, these these items are. So just want to thank uh, again everyone for the work uh, on, on equity issues, on complete streets, and on safety. Um, and I look forward to uh, any comments uh, and questions for me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Director Omashakin, for your incredibly compelling report today. Um, we are committed to partnering with you to achieve real results. And we thank you for your vision and uh, your role as the first African American uh, leader of Caltrans. And we want to see this um, continued, as Commissioner Burke is saying, in, in real uh, improvements in staff and looking at how the hiring practices and just the real achievements of the department that we can we can talk about together all around the state um, are achieved. And so we thank you for your vision and your commitment to real results together. And uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor to our other commissioners uh, who'd like to speak. With that, Commissioner Inman. Uh, yes, thank you, Director Amashak, and thank you for a very comprehensive uh, report today. Just a couple of things, and you and I have spoken uh, offline on this, about the role of infrastructure, in particular transportation infrastructure that we all work on, in economic recovery. And as we look at what will most probably be a, a prolonged recovery, it's going to take us a little while to get back, is there anything we could do together, we being the two different agencies here, uh, to avoid hiccups, keep front and center the vital role that infrastructure development during uh, a recession or perhaps a depression can play? So I know that we have high unemployment rates. We know that some of the jobs we had pre-COVID-19 simply aren't going to come back. And those of us that love this sector would like to encourage more careers in um, the transportation sector uh, for those that have had displacement. And I think it, it also goes into a lot of our equity and uh, discussions that we're having as well. So love to think about what collectively we can do together uh, to, you know, if we can accelerate more projects, whatever we can do, and uh, see how we can, you know, really borrow from our friends at Federal Highway where every day counts. I love that tagline uh, to make sure that those projects keep moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other commissioners who wish to make a statement or have questions of Director Omishakin? Okay. Well, thank you very much, and we look forward to our tremendous work together. Thank you for your time, and uh, we will move to um, rehear item three uh, after we finish item four today. So with that, um, Terry, would you mind um, getting us back on track with item four, and then we will uh, rehear item three for uh, one small issue. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. So item four was a resolution of necessity for property in LA County. And I believe that um, Mike Whiteside was finishing up his presentation. So Mike, um, if, if you need to finish that presentation, and then I, I do know that uh, Michael Rubin is on 
um, and would like to speak to the commissioners. Okay, so we'll back up a little bit. Um, can you go back one slide, actually? I just sure. would like to remind the commission where we were. So in, in its essence, uh, the property owners asked to, um, to be hands off in the post, to, in the post in the post construction post construction uh, restore restoration of their property. And next slide. I gave a uh, list of reasons why the department uh, should not and cannot or does not do this uh, because it's impossible for us to separate uh, completely sever the relationship with the owner and, and just do the work turnkey. Next. The city requires uh, the owners to file for permits. Next, the work requires negotiations with the tenant and uh, the department should not be put between a tenant and a property owner. Next, it's best if the property owner has control over the work on the property to assure that they get what they want. Next, uh, the department has coordinated with the city to answer as many questions as the, uh, as the owner has presented. We've, we've provided responses. Next, uh, and this is the main one. F uh, fulfilling the request really sets a precedent. On average, the department acquires over 800 parcels a year. If we be begin re-landscaping and doing other post-construction work for owners, the department will require a significant staffing increase, for which we're not reasonable. And lastly, least private injury refers to the entire project and applies to minimizing impacts of physical property. All projects cause inconvenience uh, to impacted owners. Recognizing that, the impacts to the property can't be avoided and the owner must be involved. The department uh, will pay just compensation to the owners. So the department sees this as a compensation issue. Next slide. So I won't rephrase uh, these four points, but I do want to address a letter that uh, Mr. Rubin sent to the commission yesterday, and there are a couple of points I'd like to address specifically. Um, one is, according to our legal counsel uh, that I've been working with, lease private injury refers to the physical property. The law recognizes that property owners will be impacted by projects and that there is a certain amount of inconvenience for that. And for that, we compensate the property owners. The other statement made is regarding the owner's um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Friedman's age and that he cannot manage his properties or cannot manage this post-construction restoration. Uh, Mr. Friedman is not the only owner of this of this property. There are others and we have been actively working with his uh, daughter during the entire negotiation uh, phrase of this. So with that, um, the department will continue to actively negotiate but to ensure the project continues, uh, we request your approval of this resolution. And District 7 Director John Belinsky and I are here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions about this item? OK, uh, Terry, could you? Uh, Give us your recommendation so that we could then turn okay. that in. Before we do that, I believe Michael Rubin, um, the property owner, is on. Yes. So if we unmute him. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address uh, the uh, commission and the honorable commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Rubin. I'm the attorney with the law firm of Rutan and Tucker for the Freedmans, who are trustees of their trust, the owners of the property. I have uh, been practicing law for since 1974, so that's about 46 years. And my main specialty is eminent domain. I represent a lot of public agencies in acquiring property. And I also represent private property owners uh, in dealing with uh, eminent domain action. So I don't come to this as a babe in the woods. And I wanted to you know, give you that background in terms of what we're dealing with here. I have some kind of experience with these issues. 
what we're uh, dealing with in terms of this particular property is a rather modest take. It's not a large take. It's the taking of the landscaping in front of the property, which is property on two corners, two major corners, 186th Street and Crenshaw Boulevard. And it requires the removal of business sign, which you saw in some of the pictures shown by staff for the coffee, uh, bean and tea leaf business very prominent sign and which will be removed by the project and will have to be relocated to very mature trees some bushes and a very very nice landscaping strip that that forms the entryway to the project so the question simply is you know who is to do the restorative restorative work on this and it's my um position and the owner's position that this restoration work which is really for restoration within the tce and it would require actually a modest additional tce which we would give should be done by caltrans and should be part of the project now staff indicated well this would create a precedent well, you know, you've created several precedents. Some of the precedents referred to earlier while I was, you know, uh, waiting for this uh, item to come up had to do with the historical act activities of Caltrans and the commission relating to uh, racial relationships and, 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 uh, and uh, social justice and changing the ways things are done. And change of precedence, you know, changes are sometimes good. I mean, that's that's what agencies that are looking forward should do and need to do to constantly improve. So a, a precedent shouldn't scare anyone as long as it's a good and healthy and progressive precedent. So, you know, being concerned about doing things a little bit differently should never scare anyone from doing something. We should be looking for positive changes. Now, this is a very modest thing. And in effect, it shouldn't really be much of a change at all, especially when we're dealing with property owners that want uh, this work to be done by, by the agency. What we're dealing with is the requirement for a project to be designed in a manner that is compatible with the greatest public good. And the next part is the least private injury. Somebody earlier said the least public injury. No, it's not public injury. It's the least private injury. And we're talking about the design of the project. So the project shouldn't be designed so that it causes a lot of damage requiring the property owner to seek massive compensation. Compensation has nothing to do with project design. Project design should be such that compensation needs should be minimized so there's the least private injury that's built into the project itself. So the owner doesn't have to go through expensive proceedings fighting for compensation. This is a small case. It, it's very expensive to deal with compensation in a case like this. Um, compensation isn't even supposed to be the issue here. The, the issue is project design. And it's our position that in order to cause the least project, least private injury, if that is the task, if that is the mandate, if that is what the statute requires, then you have to look at what mitigation measures would be appropriate to deal with the damages or harms to the private property that's caused by the project. And are there ways we can mitigate that harm? So here, and, and should they be built into the project? Here, the natural thing is that a, a uh, business sign, prominent sign, is being removed and given to the owner 
to say, well, you guys relocated. Trees are being taken down, landscape taken down, and and the owners told, well, you figure out what kind of restoration is is appropriate. Again, this is not too complicated. It's simply a matter of reestablishing the landscaping uh, and 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 relocating the sign. It's a matter of dealing with the public agency, getting the permits. This is a uh, complex process for elderly owners and it's true they have a daughter in college that is not a land planner but they has sat in at some of the hearings she hasn't been a negotiator but she has sat in at some of the uh, the first level review and the second level review uh, that we've had with caltrans which is a great process but it's been the owner, Mr. Friedman, and myself that have been the uh, the players in, in those meetings. She wouldn't be expected to be the one to go and deal with uh, public agencies uh, and, and plan it. But the, the point is that dealing with landscape architects to, to, to uh, uh, figure out the uh, the uh, re-landscaping, uh, getting the permit for relocation of a sign um, uh, and dealing with the uh, approvals, dealing with contractors. That's very active uh, process for the Freedmans who bought this property as passive investors. Um, they would like Caltrans to build into their project the rather basic mitigation measures of relocating signs and it's not novel for a public agency to do that that's done all the time it is a pain for a property owner to deal with public agencies and beg them to give them permits you know a, a caltrans who has a relationship with the city because after all this is actually a city-driven project to widen a city road project the city is asked for, and Caltrans is cooperating with the city and getting it done. They're the ones that can you know, grease the skids to get the permits uh, for this. This is not a con complex landscaping matter. It's basically reestablishing the tree and the landscaping, moving it back, and um, and getting that done. Now, as far as approval by the tenants, um, the tenant is a coffee, uh, uh, bean, and, and tea leaf uh, business. Uh, the fact is, you don't need the approval of the tenant to do the take. Once something is built into the project, there's no approvals needed. I mean, you just go forward and you negotiate with a tenant and, and in the in the owner and compensation something that's built into the project is not something that you you need cooperation from obviously we should be consulted as far as our desires and we have indicated what our desires are um, it's a, a simple moving back of the landscaping strip it's re-establishing what was there leave the property not as kind of a mess in the front but leave it in a reestablished condition with the the uh, business sign back up. Uh, this is the gateway to the property. Uh, leave it in in uh, this kind of uh, uh, condition, and that as a rehabilitation project for an owner that just doesn't want to engage in it. So again, quick repetition: the obligation is to design a project to have the least private injury. Does this project result in the least private injury? Answer no, because it leaves the property in a rehabilitation state that has to be dealt with by the owner, which is problematic. Would it be the least private injury if the mitigation measures were incorporated into the project? Answer. Yes, that would be less private injury. So if you were to adopt the finding of does this project, is this designed 
in a, in, and laid out in a manner that is compatible with the least private injury? The answer would be no, you cannot make that finding. To do so uh, would require this mitigation measure, particularly at the request of the owner, to become part of the project. We'll cooperate, of course, with that. We're not talking about uh, huge dollars here. We're not seeking huge compensation. We just want the property to be put back uh, as close to the way it was as it could be without the owner having to be the one to go traipsing to the uh, public agency and um, getting all the approvals for this. So, you know, doing this in this kind of situation would be the forward-looking um, 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 practice on the part of Caltrans if the owner cooperates uh, with it. And we're requesting that it, that it be incorporated into the project as a mitigation measure. So we would, at a minimum, ask you to, to continue this for further study uh, or that you uh, amend the, um, the proposed resolution to include the change of, uh, of the, adding this mitigation measure of reestablishing the uh, landscaping and, uh, and the, um, the business site. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Terry, I was wondering if you could uh, guide us here and uh, so we can work towards a motion. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, let me restate the three issues that have to be considered by the commission because it's it's been a while, so I want to make sure everyone is aware of them. Um, the first one is, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project? And number two is, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? And three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? And again, the commission um, does not determine the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired nor deals with any issues other than those three that were just stated. Um, I'm going to recommend that the commission approve this resolution of necessity. Um, I would I would state that some of the issues that the property or the representative raised um, are valid issues that hopefully will be resolved by Caltrans and the property owner and through a compensation measure. And if not, then um, you know if, they, if if so be it, they they need to take this to a court proceeding to resolve. But it's. To me, I, I believe that it would be a compensation issue. Okay, so if you're gonna read these points and then we can make a motion, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, well, those those were the three issues. So the, um, okay. the three that I just read were the three that the commission needs to consider. So, Great. Um, yeah. So with that, this, um, commissioners. This is Commissioner Dunn. I'm prepared to support the resolution and, uh, and move to support. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Kehoe. Wonderful. Uh, with a motion and a second, Douglas, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner ah. Burke. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. Uh, abstain. Commissioner Dunn. Yes. Mr. Eager, I believe you had a time conflict. Uh -huh. Mr. Guardino. Yes. Commissioner Inman. Yes. Mr. Kehoe. Aye. Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Tavaloni. Aye. Chair Norton, Vice Chair Norton. Aye. Vice Chair, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm going to call on Mitch Weiss to uh, talk about item three. So uh, commissioners, there was already a, an action taken on item three, but I understand the uh, property owner is now on, uh, the, on the line. And so I would suggest we uh, hear the property owner and then the, the commissioners uh, consider whether they want to uh, reconsider their action. Terry, can you check if the property owner's on? Sure, I believe um, it's Mr. Tyler, or Taylor, sorry. Do we have the property owner on? 
Mitch, this is Joe. Can I get some clarification with regard to this? Do we have to formally reopen the hearing since this is a quasi-judicial undertaking? Uh, that that might be an excellent thing to do, sir. If so, I would I would move that we reopen the hearing. I'm not sure what we uh, procedurally what we need to do that. Thank you, Commissioner Luke. Could we get a second? I'll second, Commissioner Inman. Thank you, Commissioner Inman. And just to take the vote to reopen the hearing, Douglas, could you read the roll? Commissioner Alvarado. Yes. Commissioner Berg. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Davis. Stay. Commissioner Dunn. Aye. Commissioner Eager. Eager. Commissioner Gardino. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Keno. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Aye. Commissioner Tavaloni. Aye. Vice Chair Norton. Aye. The motion passed. So, so we're reopening the hearing. Is the yes. Okay. And let me can I just real quick let me just remind commissioners this this is for a project um, in San Benito County on State Route 156. Um, this is the project that was um, the main purpose of the project was to relieve congestion and improve traffic flow along Route 156 um, between San Bautista and Hollister. Um, and Mr. Taylor is the property owner, and I believe he is on. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We yes, can. We can. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the commission and the honorable commissioners for reopening this matter. I'll be brief, and I, I, I'm not. I don't have any quarrel with uh, the vote that was taken, other than I was on uh, when it was first taken up on the agenda, and for whatever reason, I was I was muted, so we had some sort of IT issue. So again, I apologize, and I appreciate the accommodation. Um, just just for the record, I, I wanted to um, maybe remind the commissioners that they hadn't had a chance to look at this in a while. So this matter was, um, this project was to have been heard before the commission in March of 2019, and we, uh, our partnership received notice of it, and we had submitted a, a request um, to be heard on it at that time, uh, a little bit over a year ago, I guess about um, 15 months ago, and our, our letter that we submitted for the record, uh, we had no quarrel with the, the necessity of the project or that it's in the public interest, but it was really about whether the project was planned in a matter most compatible with the greatest public good and the least private injury. And the the issue that we had asked Caltrans to review was a um, there's a school that's adjacent just to the south of the existing 156 highway, the San Justo School. It is, uh, I believe, registered on the historic register or at least eligible to be. And um, because of that, the design of the project had been moved further to the south, further into our ranch and the, the neighboring ranch to the east, uh, taking about 70 acres of our property. So it's a pretty significant taking. And we had requested that it be reconsidered and possibly realigned parallel to the existing 156, moved slightly north so that um, uh, it wouldn't take so much property. And we had uh, a meeting in California with with a large Caltrans team, which is very uh, helpful. And, and we had some legal review conducted by uh, the lawyers at Caltrans and were advised that um, that the SHPO statutes uh, really have precedent. We, we didn't understand whether there would be some, you know, balancing of interest between the Richardson Act and, and the, you know, the, the agricultural preservation laws and the historic preservation laws, but uh, had, were advised subsequently that um, the historic preservation laws trump uh, the, the ag preservation laws, and therefore Caltrans was compelled to try to avoid the school. We talked to the school owner about possibly relocating the school, and uh, our, our ranch and the neighboring ranch were prepared to, and we actually came up with some, some what we thought was better property. But the, the homeowner uh, was unwilling to move the school, and so that really was the end of the matter other than the fact that Caltrans, the team that's working on 156, uh, were able to take a look at the project design. They narrowed the median slightly, which I think saved us about an acre and a half, which we very much appreciate. And they were able to make some other uh, changes to enable us to have sleeves into the highway for, for water running over to the north side of the property. So 
Um, mostly what I wanted to do, in addition to giving you that background, is really to commend uh, Caltrans. In particular, I wanted to uh, mention by name Jeff Purdy, Patrick Mason, and Sarah Parrish. There were, there were a number of other individuals who've been heavily involved in this. But, um, you know, really, I think the design is as good as it can be, given the constraints of the SHPO laws. Um, and so I just wanted to thank the commissioners for your time. I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not asking you to revote this matter, but I would appreciate you putting this in the record. And we still have a little bit of work to do on our differences in appraisals, but that's, that's not um, germane to this hearing. So again, thank you very much for your time. Great. And with that being said, if we don't have to change the vote, but we can just add this to the record, do we need to take a new action? Or could, okay, great. Then this action stands. Thank you very much for your additional information. And with that, uh, I think we've all been sitting here for three and a half hours um, without break. We'd like to break for lunch, and uh, so we'd like to come back at uh, 1.15. Okay? Thank Thanks, you very Adam. much.